Frank, joining us in the Bent Pixel Studios right now is uh, the uh, founder of Gambaro Fightwear. It's uh, David Hickey all the way uh, across the pond, as they say, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. What part of uh, England in particular? I live in Chester now. I'll lean on into that microphone there, or move the microphone close to you. There you go. So I live in Chester now, but yeah. I was brought up just outside Liverpool. So yeah. all my family's from Liverpool. Oh, okay. So, yeah, pretty all good right. place to be. It's where the Beatles started, you know. Yeah, yeah. Probably heard about that. I have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Gambaro Fightwear. Uh, yeah, they, uh, uh, Frank turned me on to it. Now, how did you guys get uh, hooked up originally? Well, through seminars. Actually, I got out to, uh, I was down there in the Manchester area running seminars and stuff over the summer. Uh, uh, David and I met through that, and then, uh, you know, he'd thrown me a couple t-shirts. I really liked it. Mm -hmm. the, uh, one of them was kind of like a sweep the leg type of uh, knockoff off mm -hmm. the, uh, or, you know, what's what I'm looking for, like uh, inspired by, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, the Karate that's Kid. The Karate that's Kid, yeah. 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 And so then I looked on there, and it was a lot of Japanese really uh, – influenced thought process and then mm -hmm. when he explained to me what gamburu actually meant which was to stand strong or make the right decisions in the face of adversity i was like man that's pretty cool i, I really like that and then you know the one conversation left to the other to where now i'm going to be a part of uh gamburu trying to you know be bigger here in north america mm -hmm. what got you into uh did you did you practice martial arts before you got into it were you a fan what what got you interested yeah so i, I trained thai boxing uh, for uh, oh, okay. about 15 years yeah um and then it got to the point where i was sparring with guys who were a lot younger than me and they were just beating me up constantly but i didn't, yeah. want, I didn't want to stop hey, training sounds like my i've, I've, I've experienced this <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i didn't want to stop training yeah um, and so i started doing um, some no gi jiu-jitsu okay and then moved into gi jiu-jitsu and then really i was one of those guys that just bought stuff you know bought rash guards new rash guards new gis new t-shirts yeah. new shorts that kind of thing um so i just started making stuff myself. I just came up with that. I thought to myself, why can't I make my own my own gear? Yeah. Um, so I hunted down uh, an artist um, called G Gareth Baxendale. Uh, Gartista is his artist name, uh -huh. who does a lot of work for the jiu-jitsu guys, the jiu-jitsu jiu companies in the UK. And um, he'd never heard of me before. Obviously, I didn't have a brand. There was just some random guy messaging on Facebook. And um, we started working together. Um, so initially, the brand was um, jiu-jitsu-based, jiu-jitsu-themed brand. Mm -hmm. um, so we did a lot of stuff there and it kind of just grew from there um, really uh, to the point where last year so I was, I was working full time as well um, so I had a, a full time job while I was doing this mm -hmm. um, I was just doing it because I enjoyed it you know stuff mm -hmm. that I could wear as well and it's you get a real sense of satisfaction when you see somebody wearing your stuff oh, that yeah. you haven't sold to direct you know, not one of your friends or someone you train with right. just some random person on the you know, in, on, on the circuit on the mat and um, last year I had the, uh, the opportunity to leave my full-time job um so there was uh, the company was bought out and i thought you know now's the right time to actually to make the jump mm -hmm. and to, to put more efforts into into gambaru and seeing where i can actually take it um so since then we've put together um, a pretty hardcore team um so we've got guys working for us now who have all worked at the senior director level for the likes of nike adidas uh, under armor converse so we're coming at it from a totally different perspective because mm -hmm. before it was just i'd come up with an idea send an email to someone can you make this design for me? And I'd release a T-shirt or release a rash guard. Mm -hmm. But now we're coming at it from a, a far more uh, professional um, standpoint to, to create a real combat sports brand. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's where we are now. We're, we're obviously working with Frank. Um, very excited by the uh, the franchise gyms that we're looking at, uh, looking at opening. Um, we've got the flagship gym opening in Vegas um, in the next few months, uh, uh -huh. which is going to be called Gambaru Combat Fitness Centre, uh -huh. which, is, which is, yeah, so it's all very exciting. Yeah, we got to do a rash guard. We have to do a phone booth fighting rash guard because we 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 got to align it. Frank's wearing one of our t-shirts today. We got mm -hmm. our t-shirts, but uh, we have gotten requests for the rash guard. That was actually done by a British artist. The uh, the little cartoon picture of us. We have a Gamburu now inspired one. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. Oh. oh yeah. Yeah. Oh okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. We should do that. We'll yeah. do some rash guards. Yeah. Just let me know. We'll, yeah. We'll, we'll get them done. Yeah. yeah. Am I the only guy that likes the loose fitting rash guard? No, I like the loose. Do you? Yeah. 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 I always the rash guards are always like, and I, I I guess the concept behind them is they're supposed to be like a second skin, but I don't know. I just I don't find people get caught up in it so much mm. as I just feel constricted. 
Yeah, and it's just, it's also you know if you've got a super athletic body, then you can wear the compression tops and you know you don't look bad. Yeah, but. and I do. I mean that's I mean people so tell me that all me the too. time yeah, is yeah, the yeah, thing. Yeah. But uh, actually, it's just that I'm so self-effacing. I just uh-huh. don't like. To, I don't think it's right to just throw that you in somebody else's wives face. Are watching yes, the rain, of course. You know I mean? like, you know. I'm gonna create marital strife. <laughs> yeah, you know they're gonna be thinking about you later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice, very nice. Uh, the website is what, by the way? Hold it's gambarufightwear.com. Yeah. And uh, we've got a holding page up there at the moment because we've go- we're going through a huge rebrand relaunch. Um, so if you go up there, you can sign up. You, know, you get updates on uh, when we're actually going to go live again. We're probably planning on doing like a VIP um, pre-launch uh, for you know some really exclusive kind of gear. So any updates that people want, they can, uh, they can sign up there. G-A-M-B-A-R-U fightwear. Fightwear.com. Kim yeah. Bureau. Fightwear.com. Now, did you, uh, uh, along the way, did you sort of b- become a, a, you know, were you always a fan of mixed martial arts, or did you just kind mm. of, you know, how, how did you first, because, you know, I mean, that 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 didn't, nec- that's something that sort of uh, evolved in, in England, and particularly mm-hmm. certain aspects of it. I mean, you know, the, the striking game was always much more prevalent historically than the ground game, yep. which then had to come along. So what would, what was... What was your experience with that? Well, I've always been a fan of MMA. I mean, yeah, I, I love MMA, uh, but because I was because I was training jujitsu, it was kind of a selfish sort of thing. You know, I was just making stuff for, for jujitsu mm-hmm. because there's actually a very strong jujitsu presence in the UK. Um, there's there's a lot of jujitsu clubs uh, in the UK and some really really good, uh, good clubs out there. MMA, um, there's obviously more clubs um, coming up, uh, popping up all the time. Um, but we've actually talking about another opportunity that we, we're exploring at the moment. We're working with um, an organisation called Wimps of Warrior. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them. Uh, so I think you have. Frank, remember, yeah. Yeah. So Wimps of Warrior, uh, it's, it's an amateur MMA series and anybody can sign up for it. So they take complete novices um, and they give them six months training. So the first half of the training is sort of general you know, fitness, awareness, uh, movement, nutrition. And the second half of the training is actually a full 12-week fight camp. So you, you get treated like a professional athlete. You get all the, you know, all the physio, all of the um, you know, the, the legit fight yeah. camp. And at the end of it, you have an amateur MMA fight, and it takes complete novices right the way through to standing toe to toe across the uh, across the cage with someone. That's where Brian Lacey got his fight. He did it. He started out as a wimp. Wimp to warrior. <laughs> and he became a warrior. Well, well uh, he has his moments. <laughs> <laughs> you did hang out with him at Zach Baggins, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Haunted house. So, uh, I carried him out. Warrior, arms. you know. Yes, he stepped in the cage and fought. You know. <laughs> no. So okay. So so you're you you get in there. How long has this organization been around? I haven't heard of this. Two years now, right? It's, yeah, it might, might be a, might be a little bit longer. Well, right. yeah, it's it's mm-hmm. around that. Yeah, um, but they they're expanding all the time because it's a really cool thing to do. You know, they give it's yeah. a, anybody can do it. It's, it's, now, it's, do you yeah. ever? Here's the thing, though. I would immediately be concerned that there might be a warrior who's going to try to sandbag. <laughs> so he like puts on the the tape on his glasses and you know sort of tries to to to. Uh, uh, find his best like nerd sweater, and then like you know try to th- slip in as a wimp. Yeah. But really, he's already a pre-trained warrior. I wonder if there's ever been a problem like that. They have tryouts. Yeah. So before you can actually, you, you have to be accepted onto the onto the series. So they have tryouts yeah. first, and if you turn up and you know, you jump Claude Van Damme jumping spin kicks, and yeah. you know, you're basically one of the Mendez brothers on the ground. Yeah. And then they're probably not going to let you through because it's it's not fair, is it? You know, to just come up and uh, you know, kick someone's ass. Completely. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, interesting. And then, do they bracket? Like, do they go? Do they go after they're halfway through it, and they're like, "Okay, we've gotten a lot of the wimp out of this guy, but this other guy is really still maintaining his roots." You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, do they kind of bracket it that way? Yeah, I think the, ma- the matchmaking is very, very fair. You know, they're yeah. not going to put somebody in, as you say, because some will will pick any aspect of combat sports up far quicker than somebody else. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've been ju- doing jujitsu for a few years now, and I'm still terrible. You know, whereas the other guys who've been doing it for six months pick it up really quick. Yeah. So, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll match make it very, very well, so it's not going to be a one-sided, complete beatdown. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. This reminds me of standing in line at uh, Naga, where they're interviewing you, trying to figure out your skill level, and mm-hmm. I'm in the old guy's line, you know, and I'm like – because I remember they're like, okay, well, you've had this amount of experience, you've done this, you've never done a tournament before, mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff, and then it, who knows? Then the yeah. next day comes and you're just matched up against, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I got very excited for a second because I found out that um, I think like 
by my next birthday, I fall into like the next older bracket. Okay. So I'll be the youngest guy Mm -hmm. in a a bracket. And I got excited for a second because I would be getting to beat up geriatrics. (laughs) And then one of the guys in the gym told me, he goes, oh, no. He goes, you don't want that. And I go, why not? And he goes, old man strength. He goes, now you're going to encounter that. <laughs> it's a real thing. stronger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, is this the wimp to warrior site here? I see. No yeah. skill, no yeah. skills, no experience. It's six mm-hmm. months till you step into the cage. Okay, so we got a couple of guys facing off that apply for series three. So is this televised? Is this something that is televised? So they stream it. Um, okay. They stream it on, on YouTube. Uh, sorry, yeah. they stream it on Facebook. They put it on YouTube. Um, yeah. There's, I believe they're in talks with a few networks in different countries because they're global as well. You know, they're, okay. they're doing a huge push into North America at the moment. Yeah. Um, uh, but you just signed up TriStar. So oh, okay, blow uh, that up. Guys. Blow that uh, video up there, uh, Mikey. We'll get a look at. Uh, this is, I guess, a little sizzle reel they have going mm-hmm. here. Now, was Brian on the first? Oh, there's Brian. Yeah, there he is. There he is. <laughs> he was over there praying already. <laughs> yeah. So was was he on the? Maybe is this like the first season? Do you know, Frank? I think so. Did, did, I think, the first one because yeah, this fight was about two years ago. So okay, mm. it has to be one of the first ones. Yeah, and he did. So Brian didn't have any experience before no, he did this, huh? No. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah it's just pretty cool. You know, you take them from a complete rank novice. Yeah, and teach people a load of skills, and and you know, get some females in there too. A lot of people might never step on a mat again, or they might never fight again. Yeah. Uh, but they've learned, you know, there's some life lessons in there, some life skills as well, you know. I can't sure. imagine that if you have this kind of introduction that you would want to, you know, you might not want to fight professionally, mm. but I couldn't imagine somebody going through all this and then deciding they're just going to hang it up. It's not for them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So we're working with them, and we're basically going to be um, providing all of the, the, the apparel, so all the fight wear, um, so the rash guards, the shorts, the spats, yeah. um, gloves, shin guards, um, and it's all co-branded. So yeah. we're, we're kind of bringing ourselves to the market um, at the same, at the same are, point. Are you going to have like one wimp line and one warrior line so that you can actually physically see when I change my rash guard that, okay, there's like like when you get the, the, the rash guard that's got like the, mm-hmm. the blue belt theme mm-hmm. and then there's the one with the purple yeah, yeah. belt theme and stuff like that? I believe the fight rash guards, so the rash guards you actually wear in the fights have warrior okay. on the back. Okay, yeah. okay, that's when that's, you'll that's know. the transition. Yeah, yeah exactly. That, that's when yeah, 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 that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So what do we got going here? It's like this, this they're practicing face face-offs, off, yeah. I guess, here. Okay. Face-off techniques. We're missing the narration, I suppose. That uh, Can we pull up the narration on that, Mikey? There we go. Thank you. Okay, so they're, they play the wimp music, I see, kind of like at the beginning. <laughs> Six months later, the music's like. (laughs) (laughs) I guess it's just music. We're not getting a narration here, then, I guess, right? Okay. They're practicing some striking. Oh, my gosh. Somebody just got knocked into the wall over there. Cross. All right. Yeah. Huh. So I'm going to give Brian some shit now because I've only seen him the one time. I was going to say, it looked like he missed a bunch of classes. I only saw him in the beginning. That or he was so bad at it. That... <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that was interesting. That was interesting. All right. Uh, I tell you what, you want to, uh, David, you want to hang around for some uh, for some listener questions here? Yeah. Just sit in with us on that. Mm-hmm. Do this, Mikey. Pull up uh, Frank's Twitter page, will you? Uh, at the Frank Mirror. And we'll just scroll through some of these questions and see what you like, Frank. How about that? All right. You know, you just go twitter.com forward slash the Frank Mirror. Yeah. I Mikey's Googling I, Twitter Frank Mirror. <laughs> and then it pop, I, I think it pops up faster. Okay. So I can type there Frank Mirror go. Twitter. That so I, that top tweet there, just uh, open it up. There we go. Okay. All right, Frank, uh, I'm, it's, it's your Twitter page, so uh, I'm going to let you uh, pick the questions there. We'll just uh, – actually, that first one is an interesting one because it's timely. Go ahead and read what you got there, who this it's from. There. It's from Daniel uh, Daniel Muffin. Well, Daniel. Let's see. Thoughts on Floyd Mayweather. Rest saying his wrestling is a 7 <laughs> on a 1 to 10 Have scale. you heard this? Did yeah. you hear this story? Floyd Mayweather is declaring that his wrestling skill 
has uh, well you want to talk about uh quick uh uh wimp to warrior progression in the the collegiate wrestling field uh floyd is saying that his wrestling skill level is at a seven right now a scale of one to ten that is very impressive frank well i guess first i'd ask who his wrestling coach is because mm. we brought in somebody mm-hmm. who's you know uh, a Penn State guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think it might be one of those guys that wears the money team. Yeah, ball but if it's just you know, if he's <laughs> yeah. just you know someone who wrestled in high school and they're showing him how to shoot a double and how yeah. to sprawl, he might think it's a seven out of ten. Yeah. But if he's going with you know a quality guy who's you know an all American background, you know, yeah, you know, uh, uh, he might realize it's not as good. Might uh, be a soft seven. Is what yes, you're saying. but I mean, yeah, come on, I mean, but every time someone makes a statement, you got to always take it into account that there's a marketing aspect to it, mm-hmm. and certain athletes market more than others. And, mm-hmm. and Mayweather is a marketing guy. It's like Connor saying something. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, do you think he believes that? I'm like. But 99% of probably what comes out of Connor's mouth, he doesn't believe. Mm-hmm. Mayweather's in the same category <laughs> yeah. that it's, uh, it garners interest. And, you know, you know, because people know, obviously, his boxing. He doesn't have to sell you that he knows how to throw his hands. Mm-hmm. But if he's going to step into a cage and fight, uh, people are going to bring in the question his grappling skills. Mm-hmm. You know, could you imagine if he's like, nah, man, if I get grabbed, I'm screwed. You know, it might turn a couple people off from wanting to purchase that pay-per-view. Yeah. What do you think about the ideas the uh, bonus follow up on that because people have talked about this recently. The idea of you know CM Punk is coming back in the UFC uh, at least one more time. The idea of CM Punk against Floyd Mayweather. Yeah, I think that's actually probably the best fight for Floyd Mayweather. You know, CM Punk's the weakest link in the UFC, mm-hmm. or probably anywhere fighting professionally. If you go in the top three organizations of UFC, Bellator, uh, ACB, if you had to pick a fighter that you're saying, okay, I'll give you, you know, we got to get a guaranteed win. There's nobody that I would pick before CM Punk that I know that my guy could get a guarantee, like there's no chance he's going to mm-hmm. lose. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I would think there would be, especially since the fight starts on the feet, a significant chance that Floyd Mayweather could knock mm-hmm. CM Punk out Absolutely. before they'd even get to the mat. Yeah, no. Now, if they got to the mat, even with a couple of years of training that CM Punk has had, I think that could be a real wake-up call for Floyd Mayweather. You know, It's just such a crazy thing to handicap when you're talking about putting this in. Well, the- you know, Mayweather's had so many competitions on an amateur level and a professional level. If he was to really be with a good coach, yeah, you know, if I were to work with him, I could show him – just the basics and make it quick to understand and mm-hmm. relatable to mm-hmm. the skill set he already has. Mm-hmm. You could take somebody who has, you know, in six months, I could make it to where, unless you're a purple belt in jiu jitsu, you can't mm-hmm. submit Floyd Mayweather. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, give me six months. Mm-hmm. I could hole up the, and make him a pain in the ass. And everybody can relate with that because, I mean, it's like that all American wrestler that comes in the gym and six months into it, nobody but the brown belt and black belts can tap him. Mm-hmm. Because he already had a foundation already, and the concepts are easy to, if you have a good coach, mm-hmm. to to convey over to your thought process, to, to relate to. So, But that doesn't necessarily mean he's tapping them. No, no, you're yeah. right. Yeah. But with Mayweather, it's like, look, all we got to do is, you know, ground and pound. It's like, there's our ground game right there. Yeah. You know, how to sweep, how to get on top, how not to get on bottom. Mm-hmm. And when we're on top, how to avoid submissions, move into a half guard position, how to pin shoulders, pin hips. And then from there, show the different elbows and punches and be like, look, now it's a, a close up boxing match. Yeah. Beat the shit out of the guy. Yeah. You know, you don't have to know how to do the submissions, you know. Yeah. All right. What else you got? What's the next one there? Let's see. From Dale Briscoe, which opponent intimidated you the most when you entered the cage? Uh, I think I first Frank has to remember the names of the different people he's fought. We've encountered this before, where Frank will be, we'll we'll have a conversation, David. Yeah. We'll be talking about some guy for five or ten minutes, and all of a sudden Frank will be like, "I think I fought that guy." Uh, I think. <laughs> hang on a second, and then he Wikipedia's himself. That's always the best part, where he looks up his record. I think the most intimidated, where I had. Uh, and it was actually a good self-evaluation. Like mm-hmm. it got to work on like, oh man, I might not be as tough as I think I am because I've always had like Dumbo's feather. And my Dumbo's feather is my grappling skills. Knowing that in a fight, if you're throwing punches at the same time, my ability to submit people um, is at a very high level. Uh-huh. What is and, Dumbo's feather, by the way? 
you know, like, you know, you ever seen Dumbo the cartoon? Mm-mm. Okay, well, Dumbo, I, I know uh, what the I know it's an elephant, well, the, but I haven't done all the story. Point Dumbo, you know, to fly, which he yeah. was able to fly. You know, one of the crows gives him a feather and says, "Hey, look!" You know, or I think the mouse does pulls a feather and goes, "Hey, this feather will help you fly." Uh-huh. So now Dumbo is able to fly with the feather, but okay. even though he could fly without the feather, but it gave him a psychological oh, gotcha. okay. talisman type I property. Understand. Okay. So my talisman yes. was is, is ground skills because you know no heavyweight really moves the way I do yeah. on the ground, and guys that know as much about jiu-jitsu as more than I do, they all weigh less than two hundred pounds. So mm-hmm. all of a sudden now it's like, well, I know almost as much as you do, and I'm you know thirty mm-hmm. percent bigger than you. So, uh, but then when I fought Noguera, that was thrown out the window, man. Mm-hmm. It really screwed me a little bit mm-hmm. because I never realized that I was like, oh shit, I'm not the clear cut. You know, if we hit the ground, it isn't a you know a decisive victory for me. Yeah. Um. I this guy could grab me, and I never had that thought before. I'm like, holy shit, he might submit me. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, and that screwed with my head a little bit, mm-hmm. and really had to have me. Uh, you know, I had to focus, knowing that like, oh man, I've always walked into fights going, <laughs> you know, almost kind of like I had a gun on me. Yeah. yeah. You might think you're tough, but I could shoot you, and you know. And then once that gun was taken from me, it really, uh, it really reevaluate, you know, myself. Did that make the second Nogueira victory more satisfying than yeah. the first in that regard? Yeah, because in the first one, you see that I avoided him on the ground. I mean, yeah. there was times I fought a little bit there, but you see me backing away and standing up because I knew that you know Nogueira is a mm-hmm. very fierce competitor on the ground. And so then, when the second fight became a ground fight, not because I wanted it to. Uh, because he had successfully knocked the shit out of me for a second, and um, you know, and then I just responded and was able to catch him in a Kimura. So that's why, yeah, that's probably again one of the most satisfying victories I've ever had. Yeah. All right. We don't have to do them all if you skip right. The next one wants you to make a WrestleMania pick. You probably don't know the combatants in that. Uh, anybody else look good? Yeah, you see when you want. Uh, let's see. Has your relationship with Brock Lesnar changed since the previous Bad Blood? Have you ever had any relationship with Brock Lesnar? No, not really. I mean, I remember. Do you before, even really know Brock no. Lesnar at all? Well, I know before the the second time we fought each other, we did a photo shoot at Red Rock. Yeah, and uh, we both stepped outside for a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. and, and and with no management around, and that's when we had a discussion. Like, hey, look, you know, the more people watch this fight, the better. So let's make sure we sell mm-hmm. tickets, and mm-hmm. we had one of those type of, you know. Yeah, oh yeah, discussions. But other than that, we've never. Spoken. He didn't have that Paul Heyman getting involved. Did no. he? That, well, you ever seen this guy that always <laughs> follows him around? It's like his wrestling manager. Oh no. right, okay. this guy tried to sue me when I was in my twenties. It's a long story, but I used to have I ever told you the story. Oh. All right, I'll tell you. Here's here's something for you, wrestling fan. You a wrestling fan at all, Mikey? No, Not really. really. Okay. All right. So Paul Heyman is this guy in pro wrestling that is revered among wrestling fans. He's not a wrestler. He's like a a manager. Mm. He used to run ECW, which was a popular uh, wrestling promotion. And so he's kind of like a a folk hero, you know, Mm -hmm. almost like a – trying to think of a good example, like somebody that uh, MMA fighters have just always loved as a – like a folk hero. I don't know, maybe like a Nick Diaz type or somebody. They just love the, you know, don't give a fuck attitude yeah. or whatever. Anyway, um, so so Paul Heyman has a lot of fans. And Paul was uh, has always been with Brock in his wrestling career because Brock is not great on the mic from a pro wrestling standpoint, mm-hmm. you know, and Paul's awesome at it. He's like, he has the mouth of Conor McGregor. Okay. Well, when he ran ECW, it was, um, I mean, he was a real showman, but from a business model standpoint, it did not go well. I mean, he was competing against the guy. It's like, imagine running your kind of pretty well known, but at the same time, still somewhat regional promotion against the UFC, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there's not going to be any kind of the yeah. XFL. Exactly. That trying was, to go against the NFL. Yeah, so. that was him against kind of the WWE and you know losing his okay, talent to yeah. them and stuff like that. Okay, so he's not in a good financial position. Yeah. So this is back for the couple of years that I worked in pro wrestling. So what we did was um, uh, ECW was coming to towns, coming to Dallas, uh, uh, where I'm from. And we were going to put on a show. Well, the the ECW guys were coming. Now, their company was already in tremendous financial dire straits. They went bankrupt not very long after that. But they're coming to Dallas. Well, we had this idea that, oh, what we should do is get a couple of their talents 
and book them on our show as well. They'll already be in town. Mm. They We won't pay travel expenses, things like that. And they didn't have exclusive contracts. So it was like, I mean, that was one of the benefits of them being on a smaller show as opposed to, you know, you can't just, you, uh, you know, a UFC guy isn't a free agent or something like that no. or a Bellator guy, but unless that's built into the deal. But with this, you could literally call them up and go, hey, I, I know you're not – in ECW Mm -hmm. tonight, uh, can you work our promotion tonight? So they had the freedom to do that. But what he got mad about was that they, uh, several of his top guys were coming to us and doing this and it created the perception that that could cannibalize ticket sales. Right. So, Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know, you, you may not go pay to see them in my big promotion. If you can also go see them, a couple of nights later, maybe for a cheaper ticket okay. with these smaller guys. But here's the thing. That wasn't really the issue. He had canceled the Dallas show several weeks prior because he didn't have the money to pay the wrestlers, right? But what he did was he used the fact that several of the guys had booked on our show as a scapegoat for why the show got canceled. So what he told all of his fighters was, hey, because he owed them a bunch of money at that point. He owed some, I mean, a lot of these guys had not been paid. This is all publicly documented stuff at this point, but a bunch of the guys had not been paid. So he's got wrestlers calling him up going, hey, you owe me for the last month, two months, yep. whatever. I need to you know, I've pay my bills. Well, what he did was he used that to tell them all, hey, you know what? We had that big Dallas show book that was going to get all you guys paid off. That was going to get us flush. But Knucklehead 1 and Knucklehead 2 here booked on Richard Hunter's little rinky-dink promotion. And and that tanked ticket sales. And I had to cancel the show. So thank those guys because they screwed it all up for everybody. But the thing is, he didn't know that I knew the promoter of the venue that he was going to use. Yeah. And that guy told me, no, that's not what happened. He, he canceled that show a couple of weeks ago <laughs> because he didn't have the money. So the guy gave me the letter that Paul Heyman sent to him saying, hey, sorry, we're having mm-hmm. to cancel the show. We don't have the funds to do it. And, of course, it was dated, and I put it on our website. <laughs> so it's up there now, and he just got caught. He got exposed. Yeah. So next thing I know, I'm hearing from his attorney, who I think was his brother or something like that, that they were going to sue me. I think our grounds. Uh, that, uh, I was just thinking the same. Uh, yeah, I, it was, well, he never really said. It was just kind of, I'm going to threaten you with a lawsuit yeah. if you don't pull that down. I mean, I'm probably all of 25 mm-hmm. at the time or something like that, you know. I mean, nothing came of it, obviously. Right. There was no grounds. There yeah. was no lawsuit. But I always uh, I always remembered that because uh, then later on when I got into MMA, I'm like, oh, this guy. Again. <laughs> Look at this. Now he's – and that's what I've always thought. You know, one of these days, if uh, the Frank Mayer, uh, uh Brock Lesnar trilogy oh, does somehow happen – There's an extra layer of interest yeah, There sure yeah, yeah. is because your that's sidekicks a, have genuine – My backpack genuine, guy and his guy. That's <laughs> right. That's right. We, we might, yeah. We might have to meet up in uh, Wimp to Warrior competition or something <laughs> oh, like that. Oh, there we go. The All right. Part. Yeah. Well, actually, That's here's a fan a, question. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, I was going to say, here's a pretty good transition to that then, Frank. This one from uh, Wingo Beings. He says, um, I am 42 and have just started training jiu-jitsu largely – uh, thanks to uh, you, Frank, and Richard going on about it all the time. Any advice for an aging martial artist noob? Well, I'll take the lead on that, yeah. Frank, if you like, because uh, that's closer to me than you. Um, you know, the number one thing I can say, you might have a thought on this too. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? 38. Okay, all right. Yeah. And uh, when did you start training? Jiu-jitsu? Yeah. Um, when I was 33. Okay. All right. So so you, you came to it even younger than, than I did. I'm 47, and I didn't start until well past 40. Mm-hmm. So um, what I will – so I'm, I'm basically more or less right about where he is. What I will say is – and this is my own personal experience is just – Keep going and don't give up. That sounds so simple to say, but it's going to, at least for me, and I. Th- this seems to not be unique to my situation, it takes a, a, a significant period of time before it really starts to click, mm-hmm. but when it clicks, it clicks 
overnight. Those that period of time that you're feeling lost, that you're turning up to the gym every day, that you're getting beat up, you're getting bruised up, all you're doing it, you're doing the tapping, nobody's tapping on you, and you just think, well, even if you have the best attitude of oh, I'm going to keep going, but I don't know if I'm getting this or not, you're building knowledge that you don't realize you're building, and all of a sudden one day it will. I don't mean you'll know everything that day, but there 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 would there was a switch that flipped mm-hmm. for me. And then all of a sudden, I mean, to, to be corny, it really was like Mr. Miyagi. I did not understand why we were waxing the car every day. And then all of a sudden, yep. I was blocking punches, wax mm-hmm. on, wax off, or, or avoiding submissions or whatever. Does that seem, I mean, you, you've seen a lot of guys start out, Frank. Does that seem Yeah, once they can fair? figure out the language, everybody's brain just works a little differently. Mm-hmm. I think that's the hardest thing that I think as coaches that sometimes they don't get, or as a trainer, as a professor, is it like... An individual, sometimes you don't know themselves well enough to know that, like, okay, knowledge is always able to be attained. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it just some people can get it through reading a book. Some people watch a video. Some people have to learn it firsthand. And that's just different descriptions of how people uh, uh, process information. So a lot of it, when, I, when I'm teaching somebody, I, I try to explain to them, you know, like, you know, just put it into terms that your mind will understand it and be able to click. And that's why, I mean, I think we, you know, have you done that before where you learn a technique mm-hmm. and it just doesn't seem to work for you? You don't even really like it that much. And then like two years later, someone else shows the same exact thing, but they say it differently or put it in a different way and boom, it clicks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was the difference? Just really about the uh, presentation that now your brain, the way you're wired, the way you think, mm-hmm. can now go, oh, I can use this. This mm-hmm. works. This is my language now. Mm-hmm. You know, and so always trying to put everything into your language. You know, and, and so that's why I tell everybody, you know, learning. That's why learning your second martial arts is easier than your first. Hmm, that because makes sense. Because yeah. once you develop a pattern of, well, this is what it, I have to do to make this uh, for my brain, my body to assimilate this. You know, then you learn how to do it in the next one mm-hmm. and, and streamline the process. I also remember there was a point where my <coughs> my <coughs> jujitsu brain exceeded my physical capabilities or limitations mm-hmm. at any given point, and there's satisfaction to that too. Even when you can't achieve what the ultimate uh, what objective you're intending to in that particular scenario, just knowing that you weren't panicked, that your mind knew what you were trying to do. Cause sometimes you do get there. Sometimes you don't, sometimes you fall short, but at least I can remember going from losing that panic feeling of like, Oh, what do I do? What do I do? It, it got more to a point where almost every time I knew what I needed to do. Now the trick was to actually be able to do right. it. The trick is the how. Yeah, that's what people because so many people will be like, well, you know, I, I'm not going to quit or I'm going to do this or I'm going to keep this mindset. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that's great. Those are words all of us can figure out by watching a fucking Rocky movie. Mm-hmm. Just don't give up. OK, <laughs> how? Mm-hmm. How? When that thought of quitting comes into your brain or you get intimidated and you go, well, I'm not really trying to win now. I'm just trying not to lose. Mm-hmm. OK, it happened. That, mm-hmm. that thought tickled into your brain. Now, what is your process to reverse that Mm -hmm. or to change directions or to redirect it or, you know, what is it for you, you know, and and that process. And that's the part when people tell me, well, I just, you know, uh, if I was in a street fight, I just, you know, no matter what, you'd have to kill me. I'm like, really? (laughs) How? How are you going to keep that mindset? Well, what do you mean? I'm like, eh, it's not that simple. And the fact that you think it's that simple means you've never fucking been there. Mm-hmm. You've never been pushed to the brink of exhaustion, of pain, of of human capability where you're just like, oh, fuck, I think I would rather die yeah. than take one more step. And so it, there is a process, but it's the how. And that's the part about martial arts is so great is when you're in there learning, mm-hmm. you know, going out there and fighting and training and you're on the mat, it's all the how. Mm-hmm. You know, like, oh, how are you going to get to this? How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? You know, how are you going to overcome this? You know, goals and, and, and objectives are simple. We all mm-hmm. can figure out, well, I want to fucking choke that guy. Mm-hmm. Cool. How are we going to get to that point? You know, and all the different processes that are going to occur from there and all the subdivisions and offshoots. Yeah. It's like a fucking dancing on a spider web. Well, one other one other big achievement for me, I know, and I, I don't know how uh, how big uh, our listener. It's okay. I, how, uh, how how big this guy is, but for me, being just kind of an average size, you know, person, one hundred and seventy pounds, somewhere around there, average height. 
um, was I used to freak out whenever the big guys would come in mm -hmm. and I had to drill with them, right? Yeah. Just the, 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 the big heavyweight guys because it was always one of those big brother situations of just like these guys were used to being the biggest – people mm -hmm. right and so even without skill they could just sort of lay on top of you and smother you with their 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 big body yeah. but and and i used to i got oh you made me claustrophobic you know i didn't i didn't like the feeling of my my natural untrained reaction was keep them at a distance get this person away mm -hmm. from me it was it was such a reward to learn that oh no let me get them in close let me get them on the ground. Let me neutralize their size advantage. And it also, if they don't know what they're doing, let me use their weight to their disadvantage. Let me use the fact that they're going to gas quicker to their disadvantage. And it was so satisfying when you would see those guys who first had that mentality. Now they're running out of gas. Now they don't know that they've set themselves up for this sweep. Next thing you know, I'm on top of that kind of thing. You know, and of course, if they stuck with it, they got better as well. And you're always going to have a size advantage. But that, I think, was important. And I also always felt like, too, from a practical standpoint, that is an important skill because, you know, you, you should want to be learning a, a, a basic means of self-defense. Sure. And I've always – I mean, I typically don't put myself in a lot of dangerous situations, but I did realize when – that mental part of me flipped to where I'm like, you know what, no matter what situation I'm in, I'm going to know, I'm going to have a, 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 a base of ideas of how I should handle that rather than the, the panic, the freak out, you know? So if someone, and uh, the majority of people you're going to be encountering on the street, completely untrained individuals. Yeah. I mean, that's the deal. So, you know, I've, I've actually heard this described one time from like, uh, um, Tell me if you've ever heard something like this, where it's like, okay, you train to get your 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 blue belt is like a test of being able to practically defend yourself, and then after that, you're training to compete against other belts, yeah. right? Once you're a blue belt in jujitsu, in a street fight, you're, you're going to win ninety nine out of hundred times. That's the idea, right? Somebody who else after who blue belt, you're right. just learning how to fuck up other jujitsu guys, right? Right. So right, right. I guess if lightning struck and you got into a fight with another yeah. guy in the street, yeah. all of a sudden you go for a knee tap and then you're mounting him and he fucking up and rolls you into guard. It's like, oh shit, you know what you're doing too. Yeah. <laughs> now, right. now it's like who knows more. Yeah. yeah. And so you know, I I think that there's a there's a, there's a real sense of of confidence that you mm -hmm. can you can get from that. You know, and it doesn't mean that somebody can't still shoot you. I mean, that's why Frank carries a gun <laughs> right but but i mean just 99 out of uh, 100 times or, or more if it's just that completely unprepared anger takes over mm -hmm. someone they don't know what they're doing that sort of thing you don't have to panic in that moment you're like okay well number one i'm calm i'm not panicked and number two if 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 this guy really pushes this then i know i know what we'll do well and it's also an advantage i think to not be the biggest guy in the gym. Yeah. Because if you notice, most guys that are big don't have good killer instinct. Mm, you know, yeah. They're not used to having a fight from bo the bottom. They're not yeah. used to getting, you know, uh, bullied. Um, you know, uh, uh, without getting too deep, if I didn't have the past as a child that I had, I don't think I would have that streak in me that allows me to viciously look i mean when i fight people i am looking to break something on you yeah like my brain when we click on is like how can i you know yeah like i'm hunting that down i want to choke you unconscious i don't want you to tap i always thought that was weird when people tap people like i got him to tap i'm like that sucks he tapped before you broke it you <laughs> right, know what I mean? like, right. that is yeah. seriously my mindset yeah. when i grab you in a kimura mm -hmm. i'm like please don't tap before i can get to this fucking thing you know yeah. i really hope that i can experience the you know the, the true nature of what this should be mm -hmm. uh, but most big guys don't have that most guys mm -hmm. are you know little dudes are much more dangerous and typical if, if, if given the right tools because they're already used to getting their ass kicked so they get that fear out of their brain when it's like all right you got your ass kicked yeah you live through it right yeah all right so now we can get past that and we can just worry about fucking somebody up mm -hmm. yeah all mm -hmm. right cool because you try not to think like anytime i get into an engagement you can't think about winning or losing I just think about how bad I can hurt you until the fight's over with, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the right mindset going out there and performing and just mm -hmm. go out there and trying to perform at your best. And I think big guys sometimes don't get the advantage of having that naturally. Mm -hmm. And they have to learn how to put themselves at deficit in the gym to get beat up so that they can, you know, uh, 
get rid of those inhibitions. Jeez, remember that last couple of lines for the Bellator Countdown show. That'll that'll draw some viewers. Well, I was just thinking about um, you know the, the comment the guys put yep. there about being a noob. Because I remember when I tried transition from Thai boxing to to Jiu Jitsu, mm. and I thought oh, I'd be quite an easy transition. That you know, a reasonably fit guy, I've been training mm-hmm. martial arts for a long time. And it's it's kind of where the, the brand name came from as well because I actually had somebody's knee on the side of my face and mm. I've got my other side of the face on the mat and I'm thinking, do I really need this in my life? Is, yeah. this, is this the right <laughs> thing I want to be doing? Yeah. You know, I'm paying for this at the end of the day. And then um, when I was looking, for, so obviously it just kept going back. You do, you keep going back and you just get better. So I think it's mat time, isn't it? You just yeah. keep yeah. turning up, you keep going. And then when I was looking for brand names and I came across the word Gambari and I was like, oh, strength through adversity. <laughs> I know that that makes sense now because yeah. you know you just keep pushing and you keep going and ultimately good things will happen. Okay, we're not going to be most of us aren't going to turn around and be the greatest in the world. Yeah, but you will get better. Yeah, yeah, true. Give us a couple true. more here, Frank. Uh, what else you like there? Uh, the one you guys like? Oh, uh, you pick. You pick. Just uh, one jumps out uh, at why you. Why do? Okay, here I'll stop there. Replying to uh, King. Uh, what 88? Is he, uh, yeah, King 36. 36? Okay. Yeah. Uh, why do the top paid fighter boxers gloat about how much money they make compared to team sports where you never see it happen? Tom Brady, Peyton Manning made millions, but you never see them talk about it as much as Connor and Floyd. <laughs> well, I think because in our sport, uh, how you get paid really is indicative upon how many tickets you sell. You know, the reason why Connor and Floyd can boast that they make millions is because people are willing to pay to watch them fight when they put them on a marquee. Whereas, you know, a Peyton Manning or, a, you know, a Tom Brady, people are not specifically buying tickets to just go watch them play. They're yeah. watching the team. Now, they mm-hmm. can enjoy certain players on the mm-hmm. team, but there's a team aspect to it. So you take less credit for, well, our team, you know, generates this many ticket sales. Yeah, the team does. Uh, you know, you might not generate that much. Uh, you know, I, I guess it'd be the equivalent of maybe bragging about how many jerseys they sell. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the, the, how many kids buy my jersey could be mm-hmm. probably that area more. But with fighters, there's, there's just that direct correlation to. I sold out T-Mobile Arena with my name. It's like, oh well, shit, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, well, I know I have a couple of thoughts there too. One, you're talking about an individual sport versus a team sport. Yeah, yeah. okay, that's just, that's the main right. one, really. Right. So there's that. Uh, number two, becoming a millionaire in mixed martial arts is still a pretty new thing. I yeah. mean that that happens to some people, mm-hmm. and it happens to more people than it used to, but it's still not by any means the majority no. of uh, professional fighters. I remember when I first signed with the UFC, Pedro Hizzo was at the top of the food chain mm-hmm. in the heavyweight division. Mm-hmm. And I remember that I was sitting there listening, and he got paid $180,000 a fight. And that was like astronomical <laughs> yeah, fucking money. Yeah, yeah. I was like, holy shit. If I ever get to a point where I make $180,000 a fight, I've made it. Yeah. If right now I fought for 180 grand and I had to tell it to my wife, <laughs> <laughs> she's like, "What the fuck happened?" You know what I mean? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's all relative. And that's the next yeah. thing I was going to say is that because I actually think that you do. There is an element of it. I mean, just to say, what were the examples he used? Like Tom Brady and somebody else. Peyton Manning. I mean, yeah. I mean. Maybe those aren't good examples. I, I, I don't know how they handle their personal finances. Those may not be good examples of idiots with a bunch of money. But trust me, there's plenty of them in the NFL, and there's plenty of them in the UFC and, and, and elsewhere, all sports, because a lot of those people are coming into making that kind of money without much of an education, certainly mm-hmm. any training on how to handle it. And they immediately get caught up in this thing of, oh, I got to show you that I'm richer than you. I have the yeah. nicer suit than you. I have the nicer car than you. I have always been amazed that there hasn't been one, and maybe there's been some examples of this and you don't hear about them because of what of the very nature of what I'm about to say. But I've always been amazed that there hasn't been at least a few really notable examples of guys who just wear their practicality, if not mm-hmm. their frugality, on their sleeve yeah and have that be the cool thing just be like you know what here's what's cool about me is i have i have fuck you money but it's i I just have it that's all i don't have to 
I, I don't have to, to, to have some sort of outer shell that mm-hmm. exhibits that. What it means is is that no owner owns me. You know, no mm-hmm. I could retire right now if I decide to. I mean you want to talk about ultimate power? Imagine holding that over a promoter. Yeah. Imagine a promoter or a team owner going, you know what, that guy has been so smart with all the money that we gave him. If he if I got on the wrong side of him today, he could say, screw this, I'm out, and then guess who's fucked? Me, the owner, because i got to sell tickets, i got to sell jerseys, all the rest of that. I think that would be the ultimate power to have over some middle-aged white guy that owns your team or owns your promotion. Basically, you just set the format for why I am really curious what's going to happen with Connor leading on here. Because Mm -hmm. Connor now never has to fight another day in his life. Yeah, you know, I mean, he really, I mean, the UFC can't hold that over his head. We're like, well, we might not fight you for a year if you don't accept this fight. Fuck you, then. Yeah, as <laughs> long, well, and here's the thing that that's that's the importance of the decision he's got to make, though. At this point, he's got to. You're right. He's in that position. He's but. He's got to stay in that position. He's got to right. be smart he with can't money. Be can't be blowing every it all weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So, you but know. he's also in the position now where he's saying to the UFC and Dana White that I want a new division set up at 165 pounds. Because he came out and said that, yeah, didn't he? you know, yeah, I, I no, want a new division set up, so he, so yeah. he's he's comfortable then it's between one seventy and one fifty five. So that that's that's power turning around. That is power. Set a set a division up for me. No, you're right. That's power. Mm-hmm. Just like, you know, possibly getting in some sort of co-promoting situation is power. Yeah. He could he yeah. he may be the first. I mean, I remember for years and years, you know, that was a non-starter with the UFC. Dana mm-hmm. White, you were too, where he used to get asked about it a lot was because of Fedor, because all the yeah. years they couldn't get Fedor in the UFC because they wanted to co-promote, and he would say no. Mm-hmm. But it there was a there was a point a couple of years ago where he got asked that question about Connor, and he's like, yeah, we're probably gonna have to look at that. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's okay, I, I give up. Like yeah, yep. we're 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 probably at that mm-hmm. point. Did you guys ever hear the story about Barry Sanders and the bonus check? You know, the running back for the uh, uh, Detroit, uh, Detroit Lions. Lions, one of the greatest running backs of all time, and uh, he was a guy who drove like an old car at least i mean not not like a, a beater but i mean mm-hmm. a car that you know he i could afford a sensible middle class guy totally car. right you know and uh at the time he's one of the highest paid players in the league and mm-hmm. all this and he just goes his whole career and banks his money well there was a, a year that he had cheat he hit a bonus clause he got like a million dollar check for something it was like league mvp mm-hmm. or i don't know what it was hitting maybe a rushing level or something that triggered a bonus clause in his contract so like a couple of months go by and the detroit lions uh accounting department calls the management and they're like something's not jiving here like we're off the books are off to the tune of like a million bucks or something so they trace it to this bonus check that they had given barry sanders not only had he not cashed the check but when they called him about it and they said, where's that check? He said, I think it's in the glove compartment of my car. <laughs> and so they actually had to go find the check, probably reissue another one at that point. But, I mean, imagine being in a position where, you mm. you know, you, you're not you, – I mean, you know, you're going to think to put it in the glove box of your car, but you're not super concerned about, you know, keeping the lights on when you got that million-dollar check. Yeah, I guess you're not hurting for money when no, you lose no, a million-dollar check. Thing. Throw us one more, Frank. Pick one more there. Okay, let's see. Oh, yeah, I hear this one. We'd love to see you in some grappling tournaments. Any thought on that? Yeah, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm planning to do so. Oh, I'm, this is a question for you. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't, well, you can be I didn't in there realize too. it was addressed Actually, with the ACB has a whole jiu-jitsu uh, mm-hmm. side now, so I'm looking yeah. at doing some super fights. Zarabak uh, Hasiv, who's Marabak's son, he heads it, and so uh, we're in the talks of trying to make something happen. Oh, gee, so you can do it. Uh, probably no gi. I mean, let's be honest. My my gi game is is, is ancient. You know what mm. I mean? Like, I realize it now. Like when I see some of the gi matches, I'm watching some of like the lasso guard and stuff. I'm like, yeah. I don't know any of that shit. Yeah. I, I really don't. Like, I, and to the to the tune of even when people, you know, I come do seminars. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, could you put a gi on them all? The shit I'm going to be showing you is 15 years old, man. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm just being serious. Like, yeah. I'm on the cutting edge of MMA jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. And no gi jiu-jitsu, I, I, you know, has a lot of carryover. So I'm good mm-hmm. at, you know, I feel comfortable there teaching that. But gi jiu-jitsu, I'm like, eh. You know, I mean, I got Robbie. 
Robert's pretty good at jiu-jitsu, guys, <laughs> yeah. with a gi on. You know, let's, you might want to get him to come down to tease his seminar. So. Yeah. All right, good questions. We'll save some of these for uh, next time as well as uh, we've got to uh, wrap up here and uh, get on about the business of our day. All right, uh, David, one more time. Uh, tell everybody where they can find uh, Gambaro Fightwear and follow on social media. I'm sure all that kind of stuff as yep, well. So right? it's uh, gambarufightwear.com. Mm-hmm. Um, sign up for updates. We've got an email collection on the, the homepage. Um, Instagram is Gambari Fightwear and Facebook Gambari Fightwear too. All right, David Hickey has been our guest in studio. Thanks for uh, coming in and Pleasure. visiting. Thank you. Absolutely. Frank, uh, this segment of Phone Booth Fighting uh, brings another guest into the Bent Pixel Studios. And uh, I'm at a loss here because uh, you, you just showed up with this handsome fellow. I met him a few minutes ago. So you're going to have to handle the introductions here. This is Ruben. He's my uh, uh, trainer right now that does all the, the PT, the, the physical therapy uh, for this camp. I got introduced to him by Aaron. And uh, he's just, he's kind of, you know, he's very good at what he does as far as fixing up on my shoulder. My leg, I had a hematoma the size of a softball on it. I thought I was going to have to quit practice for a week. And within one session, I went to bed that night without any pain. So, but, uh, but on top of that, the reason why I'm sitting there, I was like, ah, oh, you know, Ruben be an interesting interview on top of our mm-hmm. podcast because uh, not only does he do mainstream stuff you know as far as you know all the you know the the stretch uh uh what's it called act uh faster stress therapy yeah so he does mainstream things that most athletes would be aware of but that he's also very in tune with some of the things that are more uh for people to know dan hardy is you know oh, you know, yes hardy's into all the new age just different sure you know, uh approach to stuff and and guess what ruben's there too okay uh, we're gonna actually do a frog session there and i want you to you know we're gonna talk about it a little bit because uh we'll do some amazon on warrior frog poison yeah he's a little bit of a, a brujo like a blanco like a, a white witch doctor is okay I, is where i've kind of nicknamed uh, reuben here <laughs> yeah i thought about dan yesterday because uh, we took uh, a couple of the dogs hiking at red rock and uh we're we're climbing up and down all these rocks and everything and i was thinking about dan because when dan lived here he used to go out there and run around barefoot he i thought, do that oh you do that I, told you i i, I my, like one of the first dates with my girlfriend i i hiked at red rock about three miles barefoot and yeah I was, and i was like people are like are you crazy i'm like no you feel more connected to mother earth you know uh-huh. it's not the they call it pachimama it's like you know somebody always told me and i believe it the shoes are just caught them to the feet yeah it's like you're not able to like to ground yourself whenever when, when you wrestle i mean when you're in the cage you don't wear any shoes mm-hmm. you know your feet are pinned to the ground because you use, you work those muscles out too and so as when you're a kid remember you're a little kid no shoes running like on the road on the pavement not in my house shoes always i was yeah you see me i now yeah. i've upgraded to flip-flops but yeah i love being barefoot yeah, yeah but i'm here. with you i understand so that's probably yeah it's maybe comes for it see all i hear is my mom going where are your shoes where are your shoes yeah uh, yeah so you spent a lot of time barefoot as a kid when i was yeah i grew up yeah. in like in uh, southeast texas in the gator capital of, of texas called anawak so every yeah. person is three alligators and there's like 2700 people there yes and so growing up in the country it was like you know pavement road like grass so always barefoot and now that i'm old i'm like man it's, it hurts to walk on these rocks but i remember as a kid like oh this is just fine for me i could just uh-huh. run down the road and feel fine and now that we get older we're like shoes 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 like Shoes are the condom to the feet. Yeah. And there's so many, as athletes nowadays, you see so many injuries happen to, like, to the feet. You know, NBA players, Achilles ten, like, Achilles tendon tears, um, you know, the foot issues, like, metatarsals, because they're always wearing shoes. It, the muscles are not developed in, mm. mm-hmm. like, in the foot. And 12.5%, 50% of the bones in the body are both in the hands and the feet. So, it basically means, like, 12.5% of the bones are in each foot. So that yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> I, I will give you that my feet definitely hurt yesterday after uh, I think we hiked six, seven miles, something like that. Well, I think so. there's true. I mean, obviously, there's an advantage to having your feet protected if you're walking over harsh terrain. Mm-hmm. You know, there are uses for it. But I do agree because I, I remember as a kid, I used to have ankle problems. Not as a kid, but as an adult from all the foot locks and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I got my foot busted up real bad before my very first professional fight. And for years, my left ankle used to kill me. That's why I used to always wear ankle wraps and ties. And then I was doing research on it and stuff, trying to figure out. And I was reading that this one baseball player had the same issues and used to wear, you know, just, you know, ankle brace tie his shoelaces as tight as possible he didn't start getting relief until one of the therapists came in and go okay get your oldest pair of 
cleats that you have. And then he basically made it to where they barely lay songs to hold on. He's like, these are giving no support. He goes, exactly. We need to recondition your feet and, and ankles. Basically, you, you've had a crutch. It'd be like ba- the same as if I gave you a, a, a corset and you wore it all the time. Yes. Well, well, shit, your back muscles and your stomach muscles are going to weaken. I found that out the hard way. Yeah. I was only going to try to allude to your Thank alternate you, lifestyle. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but because of support, the body is very innovative. Our mind, our, our body will always adapt to whatever we have. So if you make something easy for yourself, then your body doesn't, well, why keep up muscle tone if I have yeah. support from the outside? So that's why I think there's a lot of truth to that as far as you know, not always constantly just wearing the thickest, toughest shoes all the time. It's like, ah, oh, put on some flip-flops, walk around barefoot. I think it'll help strengthen your feet. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Now, now, so how did you? So, uh, so, so you got you got brought into uh, to Frank's camp here, yep. right? Okay. Did you immediately start regretting it, or did it take a period of days? Or? No, it's, <laughs> it's not. I, you know, it, he got weird when he started. Like, okay, we're gonna work on your shoulder. And I took my pants off. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm like, look, yeah. you got to be totally nude, right? That old trick. <laughs> no, yeah. no, you no. were wondering why there was an <laughs> opening for the uh, for the the PT position. Yeah, there's still Sorry, a lawsuit yeah. on the yeah. lost therapist. Yeah. You know, so. no, no, that that was the second session. I <laughs> See, he fits right <laughs> in. <here. laughs> no, after, after the first time, he come out, he reminded me of Aaron. So me and Aaron have a good connection and friendship. So uh-huh. I was like, the way he talked and like, all right, man, this guy's pretty smart and open and like, mm-hmm. and then I start talking about different type of like the Cambo and like the Den- and he mentioned Den Hardy about, oh, like it's like the same stuff that Den Hardy does. I'm like, pretty much. He's like, yeah. yeah. So I, I've been exposed to that type of, of medicine because I'm more of a holistic person when it uh-huh. comes to that. And um, we talked about the Cambo, which is like the green monkey frog that is found in the Amazon. Mm-hmm. And so, right, please describe this. Mm-hmm. You're gonna like this, Richie. Okay. So the green monkey frog is it's, it's an Amazon frog, and is, is that the one where they put the arrow? They'll rub an arrow on it and they'll kill animals with it. No, not, it's not that one. So basically, this one is like you ever heard of the story of like how Advil was founded? Advil. No. Yes, Advil. So my dentist told me this. He's one of those weird guys. One of we're smart guys. So basically, he told me the story that Avil was created by these two doctors who went to the Amazon back in the 1960s, and they see this indigenous tribes eating tree bark. I'm like, why are these guys eating tree bark? Yeah. So they took that tree bark, broke it down to biomolecular level, and had natural anti-inflammatory. And then they took that molecule out, extracted it, and boom, Avil was created. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay. So this, this frog... Is the story of the frog is that in in the jungle there's like probably twenty something indigenous tribes or maybe even more. Yeah. And these people were dying and the people were dying. And somebody woke up with the dream and was like, We have to use this, this poisonous frog. And people like no animals gonna use this frog because it's poisonous. You know, if, yeah. if a if a bird was to touch it it would die. And so we have to use this poisonous frog. And so they basically burned the top layer of skin on your body. You can barely see the marks right here. You see yeah. that? Yeah, so they burn the top layer of skin on the body. And um, you drink two liters of water. You have, to face, you have to fast eight to ten hours. And they apply the frog poison. And it's one of the strongest anti-inflammatories in the world. And you basically just purge everything. You throw up, bowel movement, throw up, you shake. And you basically detoxify your, detoxify your body. And it could detoxify your body up to 20 years, up, your liver up to 20 years. Um, I got introduced to it through a friend. And that's now, not let me ask you a question. Is this just one treatment here? Oh, no. I've, I've done it eight times. And actually, I, I'm going to do it again on Tuesday. I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to do it on Tuesday and see how I feel. Oh, there's something you can do here. Yes. actually, it's, You don't it's, have to travel. To, you, you Dan have, was always having yeah. to fly to Peru. You, well, stuff. actually, Cambo is like the only medicine like amongst like ayahuasca, San Pedro, yeah. and me- medicines along that that is legal in the United States. And, oh, okay. And one of my very good friends is actually a practitioner in town. And he's been doing it for about five years. But it's been legal for about three decades in the United States. Yeah. You okay. can do it on a Friday, man. Well, you know, I, I'm detoxify I'm, that party lifestyle you've had. Doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a I'm a real teetotaler. You know, if I, uh, you you didn't uh, catch on to I, that, I will so, tell you yeah. stories like you know I, I have I have a a kid that I work with. I work with some high school kids. You have to be 18 to do it in the states. Uh-huh. And I have a kid who opened up to me and said, "Ruben, I have <clears throat> uh, I have an alcohol addiction." Mm-hmm. And he went to a game and played drunk. And he's one of the better players on the team. That he already graduated. He's, a, he's 19 now, and. He said, man, like, damn, bro, like, say, you went to the game drunk. And he said, yeah. And I say, like, I'm worried about because my family on my dad's side has a family, like, alcohol addiction. Yes. I say, you know what, bro? It's like, 
let's let's do Cambo. He said like I want to do Cambo. I was like nah, he's still in high school. I'm not quite sure if he's if, if his intentions are there yet. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, bro, let's do it. He did it, and for a whole month straight, he didn't drink any alcohol. Showed up to practice on time. Was polite. Craved healthy food. You know, he was just a complete different person. He mm -hmm. was like he was writing things down. Like at night, he said he was sweating. I'm like I'm like. All the coaches like, how long is this going to last? Because this is a good kid who kind of fell off off track. Mm -hmm. Some of his, you know, things in his life happened, like we all have. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty amazing to mm -hmm. see that. So people, it's actually these red people who are addicts too. And mm -hmm. this is big opiate addiction going on in the United States. And so this, so this medicine is practiced legally where it can help break opiate addiction. Mm -hmm. It can help break addictions. You know. Um, but it's not really advertised and marketed because we are li we live in a pharmaceutical oh, yeah, sure. country. Well, why why do you think it works? Like, why do you think so? So the idea, uh, like, do you think it's actually purging some sort of craving in that process? Yeah, you know, it's it's all your it's your attentions. Uh, when I was in when I was in Peru, you know, talk about we went. <laughs> By this San Pedro is a cactus. So you've done all the Peruvian like the ayahuasca trips. Have yes, you done I, all have, that stuff I have. Too? Yes, okay. yes, and they yes. do the combo. The tribe does it as far as warriors before yeah, yeah. battle and hunting. Yeah, because it because it resets your system. It's supposed to you know get mm. all the shit out of there, so that way your mind is more focused, yeah. your vision's sharper. Yeah, mm. it's basically it's a warrior medicine. So basically, in Amazon now they do it. And so back to the story of the tribe, you know, it saved the entire tribe from going extinct. But they do in the Amazon they go hunt, so because it increases like your your stamina, your mm -hmm. awareness, like you're more focused, like you're cleansed. You don't have that stuff in your body. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I did is like, what I just spend my money on, and I was having back pain, and my back pain went away. Mm. It's a strong mm -hmm. anti-inflammatory. And then for five days straight, I just worked out like for 14 hours, and within five days, I'm like just go going, 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 mm -hmm. going. And so it's in this is what hunters use in Amazon. It's like it's natural. Mm -hmm. So, um, I forwarded you the email so you can read that he gave me to read on the uh, combo. No, oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. read about it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting stuff. And mm -hmm. anytime that I could talk to my friend about it, she wants to come in and do a podcast because she has the whole life experience of doing that as well to get more in depth. She could tell mm -hmm. you because she's she's li on license as far as like she's under the the guideline of certified practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, she's worked on herself for about two three years before. Um, the frog actually caught her. They actually go start practicing doing the frog. Mm -hmm. And she's actually just one of the few, I think three to five people who were just elected this past year to go study, get like her master's degree to help with people uh, have different addictions. Yeah, because you keep saying that they're using, uh, majority of her work is for opiate addiction, which we know is a Correct. fucking huge problem here in the U.S. I don't know if you guys have it in England, but opiates here are just fucking. Mm. Mm. And it's, it's it's horrible. You know, she works with, the, with the, uh, a house, holistic house that, people have opiate addictions mm -hmm. um but it helps with that but you know it all comes down to what are your intentions but when i was in peru one of the guys like this this guy who served the san pedro asked um i said what are your intentions and i said he's been calling my name but the thing is one of the guys mentioned the group and like can you imagine going to a drug dealer's house and saying hey i want to buy um, a pound of weed and like okay like what are your intentions i just want to sell it make some money you know mm -hmm. okay but if you go to somebody like, hey, I want to buy some, I want to buy a pound of weed, like, what are your intentions? Like, yeah, I just want to have it in stock and just meditate. So your attentions, it goes back to your attention. What are your intentions doing the medicine? Mm -hmm. like, like, I asked the kid, what were your intentions doing with Kimbo? He's like, I want to break this alcohol addiction. I want to help break this. So it all comes back to your intentions. Like, yeah. You know, that's the most important thing, what I've learned. Like, All right, so, so do you think then, I wonder... I wonder if there is a psychological element to this where if I go in, let's say I go in and I say... Oh, um, there has to be. The placebo effect. Right? Well, no. Well, actually, what I was going to say is more like uh, more like um, uh, stimuli or, or, or maybe like uh, uh, the negative side of that. So in other words, if I go in, like you said, intentions. So if I go in and whether it's, it's curbing an addiction or maybe trying to eliminate some sort of destructive behavior, right? So if I get that in my mind, what, what you ask me, what do I want to change? Right. Well, I want to... Um, uh, Oh gosh! Uh, you know, are you I, trying to think of a bad habit you have? Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm interested. But, <laughs> Tell me one, dude. Yeah, but but, but uh, you, you know, let's say I mean addiction's a good one, but let's say you know I want to. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to be a compulsive 
eater or I don't want to be a compulsive it, it does, it, if you read the email, gambler. If you read the email, it does say that, like it does break like eating habits, like un, like unhealthy eating habits. It could break different addictions, like yeah. alcohol addictions. There's so many different benefits to it. Yeah. So and, so what I'm saying is though maybe like so if I get that in my head, right? So correct. I got that in my head. Okay, I'm going to lose it. Then I go through this extreme physical process, which you're talking about, like all the, the yeah, purging that, and all that kind of stuff. That's right? about ten tw- about ten twenty minutes. And, and when when you're when you're throwing up, you're like. Well, how the fuck am I doing this right now? Yeah, to your, like to yourself, but you're throwing up this stuff. You're like, and those all that stuff you're purging out, or your attention is like that's junk, that's not necessary. Like you'll finally get to know what a hangover feels like. Yeah, right. Like, yeah, and that's what you're thinking too. Like, why did yeah. I do this to myself? But that's kind of what I'm <laughs> saying, though. I wonder if there is a psychological element to it where you're you you get a a, a negative trait in your mind, then you do something that is initially a negative feeling, which is all that purging and all that i mean no one's enjoying that well, kind of like a reverse pablo yes exactly yeah. Yeah, that's we're, what I'm we're, saying. we're instead of reaffirming positive behavior yeah through a stimulation now we're going to punish negative behavior through stimulation yeah sort of like with that suboxone like that drug that uh i think they use it for heroin uh, oh yeah uh, addiction they, where it's like they, if you take it and then you do the drug yeah, you're you going like to nauseous, become violently yeah. ill oh really yeah. yeah i mean i don't i'm sure there are other effects uh, benefits to it than that. I'm just saying. I wonder yeah. if there is a psychological benefit because you're going through something unpleasant when you associate Correct. it with Correct. these things but, you want to stop. At, at first, I was like that, and like mm-hmm. the first, I don't know how many times, and doing other ceremonies. But after a while, I was like, I kind of enjoyed it. When I was in Peru, was like when I when I was at Hollywood, I was in Peru, I was like, oh hell yeah, let, let this shit get out of my body. I don't want yeah. this stuff. Like yeah. I don't need this. Like this is. This is like some of that baggage internally that need, that needs to be released. Yeah. Now, do you have a feeling for how much of it? Because it the, the other question I would have too is okay of the thing because you're intaking before you're expelling. So, of the things that you are intaking, right? Whether it be the ayahuasca or the cambo or whatever it is we're talking about, do you have a feel for how much of that stuff is turning right back around and leaving your body? No, you know everybody has has their own experience. Yeah. Like you know, we all have different experiences whenever we do these, these medicines, and uh, they're medicines. They're not like they're a drug. They're, yeah. They're medicines, and that that really aligns back to your attention of what you're planning to do. Um, I, I never felt that way. Uh, you know, I always went in there with an intention to do something. Mm-hmm. If it was if it was like the plant medicines, like ayahuasca, like. You know, help me understand what what is my purpose here on earth. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what is God's purpose for me here on earth? Like, let me know. Let me understand. And I've gotten the answers. It's like, my girlfriend was like, so much stuff has happened to her that with one treatment of ayahuasca, it was like ten years of therapy. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, okay, so the ayahuasca again, which and that's different. That's the uh, DMT molecule. Right? Yeah, yeah. So the cambo is not an hallucinogenic. Yeah, okay. It, it, it's 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 a it's a frog poison. You you know, anytime you put poison in the body, the body's going to respond. A certain way right um so it's not it's not it's not dmt being released you mm-hmm. really don't get visions and stuff like that mm-hmm. you would in high ayahuasca you'll last maybe three to four hours in a ceremony mm-hmm. um but the cambo like you know you prepare for about an hour and then you know you drink two liters of water and she burn the top layer of your skin and then she applies it mm-hmm. um and that you you can last up you can go up to 45 minutes if you want to I've only done 20 minutes max because i can't go more than 20 minutes man that, that's too much for me mm. but uh yeah, it's. I, I never felt that way though. I mean, you just 10, mm-hmm. 20 minutes of just letting that stuff out. And you hit a point where you're like, why am I doing this? I want to stop, take the poison off my arm. Like, mm-hmm. wherever you can apply, she could put on the meridians, she could put it on just on the first time she applied it to your arm, which is close to the heart. Um, so th- the first time is like, why am I doing this? But you hit a hurdle. And you have to just work through that. Kind of like training. Like, you hit that point, like, I always want to quit. But, you know, you got to push a little bit more to gain mm-hmm. more, to, to move further along. And that's what the, like that's what I've learned with the medicine, too. Like, all right, I got that one thing inside that's kind of still in there that, gets, that has to get out. Mm-hmm. Well, right. ayahuasca, you're not able to do here. We have to travel. Yeah, for that. ayahuasca, you're supposed to travel to, um, you can go to Mexico, Costa Rica, Peru. Which is which is in Batter San Pedro? That's, yeah, uh, Hardy's doing into that one. Oh yeah, it was like he booked a travel vacation. Yeah. I mean, I remember when we did it, it was like a whole thing, and then there was like we're going to stay in this place, and and all these other people yeah, show he, up. I was interested in until he told me something about a tobacco enema. I'm like, no, tobacco enema. <laughs> he's, he's talking about the uh, the top, you're talking about like the, the hape. 
Is that what he, what, I don't know. Like I, got, they, they, I kind of got. Well, this. he was he was looking to save a little money, so he booked one of these sort of suspect uh, yeah. resorts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't know. He uh, did. I ever tell you the story about the spirit animal? We he and I he had just come back from uh, from his first trip down there, I think, okay. and uh, he was telling me about how he had encountered his spirit animal, which turned out to be a wolf. He actually wrote about this in his book and stuff. If you ever read Dan's book, but this had just happened, and we were at the. Uh, where were we? We were at the one of the like credit casinos. Uh, uh, the one they tore down, the Riviera. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, so oh. so we're in the parking garage of the Riviera. Here's here's the whole build up. We I was doing stand up there, so that was bad enough. And then uh, so <laughs> so 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 I have questions that need answers, which is how do I get my stand up career out of the Riviera? And so uh, we first we get stuck in the elevator. I remember coming back to the car. Then we get in the car, and the whole time he had been telling me the story about how he encountered his spirit animal, which was a wolf he had discovered. And just as we are about to pull out of the parking garage, we're darting out in front of my car to the point that I almost hit him and killed him was Anthony Peroche, the Australian heavyweight mixed martial artist nicknamed the hippo and i said to dan i think i just saw my spirit animal <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> i don't know what he was doing there he got knocked out a couple you of think weeks anybody later gets a, a spirit animal that they're not proud of it's like hey did you see your spirit animal You're like no i didn't see anything yeah like, come on what was it man what was it you're like no, it, was, no, no, man. Uh, it was a slug <laughs> yeah i saw a slug great you got a wolf i got a slug uh did you get a spirit animal um, I believe mine is an owl. That's an owl, that's a good one. Yeah, for me, it's like I like uh, attentions of people are very key because, you know, people's attentions can always change. But just to sit back and observe, like, action is always key. Like, what are your attentions? Uh, let me sit back. Let me watch. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I like to be isolated in that sense. Like, okay, like, all right, I see what you're about. Right. That's a good one. I'm definitely a bear. Bear, I can, I can yeah. see that. You, yeah. you'd be, that you, that's both your uh, your spirit animal and your gay bar persona. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm a bear. No, so okay, so um, food I, 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 I'm gonna go back to something I was thinking about uh, that we were just talking about, which is <clears throat> so when I associate with something with like uh, like well vomiting i mean you know purging like something you're trying to get out of your system i'll usually think of that in terms I mean, my experience with that has been i probably ate something bad right like something is reacting inside my system it's, po it's, 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 it's poison and so it, yes. it, it comes out it comes back to poison like when you drink too much yeah. alcohol, what happens? Your body automatically purges cuz too much poison for the body. Right. It's food poisoning. Yes. You know everything is in that sense it's like yeah it's poison in your body so um there's a i, I, I forgot how it works dmt cannot be produced in your body in, that, in a conscious state right now we're in a right. conscious state <clears throat> and it's only produced like in that like that pineal gland where like in like people in yoga and mm -hmm. in the whole spirits spiritual aspects says that's where like the third eye like the subconscious is at the super conscious is at um but yeah, it, it all comes down to the poison. But I have to read about why high cannot be cannot be produced in the conscious state. Something to do with the intestines and the enzymes in the body. Yeah. Um, but it, it comes down. That's that's the poison. That's the poison in the body. That's why you throw up. Yeah. And so, it, you're put, you're putting something into your body that is not natural. Well, so, so here's here's what I'm trying to get at. I just I wonder about this. If anybody's ever taken, let's say, whatever comes out of you when you're doing ayahuasca or the kembo or whatever and looked at it and said okay this this percentage of it is stuff that was already in there that you didn't need that you need to get rid of some of this this percentage is actually some of the stuff you just put in your body you see what i mean oh, like you're, I, you're talking about what you're intaking yeah exactly. or actually yeah, what yes, you're expelling yes. what toxins they are actually like scientifically like okay your your, your body look expelled a bunch of chlorine you know like, right because you absorbed it from all the showers we take right in our so that was chlorine. already in there but what was there a percentage of this that actually you just put something in your body that wanted to get out of there immediately you you, you help out let's say like, like for Kimball, for example you, you fast eight to ten hours you drink two liters of water yeah. you want to expel water too also with stuff okay. that's in your right. body right right um, higher wasca is like the same thing. You have some water with you. You're supposed to fast or have a very light meal. Yeah. And so you're going to expel something that you intake. And so, yeah, some of the stuff that is 
like water mm-hmm. or other things you want to purge out. Sometimes water helps with the purging too. So yeah. like something's in your body and your body responds to it, so it gets rid of, gets rid of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm uh, uh, it, it it does make sense to me that that the average person probably does have a ton of stuff in their body that they probably would not want in there if they really knew you, what it was. You know, when it comes down to it, you know, like subconsciously, it's like we're talking about back to the subconscious. Mm-hmm. Like I could say. Uh, Frank, how you doing? He's like on the conscious level. You say I'm doing, I'm doing, like I'm doing good. But subconsciously, internally, he's there's something going on. Sure, it could be like something with his kids. It could be something with his wife. Something that you know, an injury that he doesn't want to share. So subconsciously, we hold on to things. And so we there's th- there's things as as kids we all go through that we hold on to. Mm-hmm. And so whenever we hold on to things, it's internal. And that's sometimes how diseases happen. How a chronic disease, like oh my god, this this this. Like sometimes it's somebody's energy or baggage projected onto you. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, why am I so pissed? Like, you ever drive on the 15 right now? Like, going like like 95 to the 15, like spaghetti bowl? Mm-hmm. And just that, like, the construction. A lot and, like, of construction you, over And you there feel right like, now. you just feel like so frustrated. And, like, you feel like all people's energy is just kind of frustrated. Like, and, and you're like, oh, man, this traffic fucking sucks yep. right now. Yep. You know, that's like sometimes that shit projects onto you. It's not even your stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, eh, it's like, if you leave early, you get there on time, you're fine. You know, just patience. You know what you find yourself stuck over there? You know what you could do for your uh, your own health? Put on the Phone Booth Fighting Podcast. Just look there at it. Go. Look at it and say, you know what? This is actually an opportunity for me to listen to a full episode where normally I'm only able to catch about a quarter of it during my normal commute. You there know? you go. So basically, like, subconsciously, we hold on to things. Even as kids, uh, I see with my dad, he shares some stuff about his, his childhood. Like, man, like, my dad still has anger towards his dad subconsciously. Mm. And so sometimes that I could say you're okay, you're like yeah, sure. But subconsciously we have to release things. Mm-hmm. It could be stuff when you were a child. It could be stuff that's not even yours. It could be that of your parents. Mm-hmm. Um, that because it's all our parents, mom and dad are both atoms and molecules. And energetically, whenever that they can see, we are produced. And sometimes they pass on their own baggage to us. Do you think that that sort of thing, that sort of clarity, cannot be achieved? without some sort of assistance uh meaning meaning this like i 100 percent agree with what you're saying like people carry this stuff with them and all the baggage and they it's it becomes subconscious and repressed and they don't even know it's there and all that sort of thing so and i also agree that i think a lot of times doing something like some sort of process or ceremony ayahuasca that sort of stuff can can actually get that out but I guess what I'm asking is, do you think that's the only avenue, the only window, or do you think somebody can can achieve that kind of, of clarity of conscious just with their own mind, mm-hmm. that's unassisted? Just, oh, man, you know, unassisted, no way. I, 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 unassisted, I mean, I, I, I believe in God, so I'm going to say, like, with the sense of assistance of God, of course, or whatever your high, um, higher power might be. Hmm. You know, unassisted is like is this is you alone in the whole against the whole world. Mm-hmm. I find that very difficult. You're not, you know, that's it's like you're like yourself against the whole entire world army of people mm-hmm. and like what's going on social media and all everything else. So unassisted, I find that very hard to do. So I think you have to learn different things and, and take things from different cultures and studies and and see what works for you because mm-hmm. you know the cambo the ayahuasca and other medicines don't work for everybody there's different ways to heal the body and everybody is different mm-hmm. we all have different backgrounds different culture different one point of views and some of us heal through god some of us use plant medicine some of us use uh different type of animals like a, a bufo like a toad or, or the frog um so everything's different there's it's a whole world to explore and, and things i wouldn't even know about there's things that's been around for centuries of medicine that we could use to heal ourselves we just don't know all of it or we're not exposed to it mm-hmm. so do you, do you think that uh do you, do you think that because uh, <clears throat> the 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 comparison to religion is an interesting one because i think a lot of people do depend come to depend on religion psychologically do you think that any of the things that we're talking about whether it's 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 religion or or you know plant-based hallucinogens or any of those kind of things do you think that they are just unlocking 
areas of your mind that are already there, or do you think yes. they're adding something that wasn't there before you it's, took that in? It's unlocking things that are already there. And like, do you do you you do not think those things those areas can be unlocked with the mind alone? They can't through meditation. But how how many of us do ha- have the like the patience and consistency yeah. to actually sit there and meditate right. 30 minutes to an hour a day like monks in the Himalayan mountains like yeah. meditate for 12 14 hours a day I'm like that's a long ass time yeah. like who has a time for that yeah you so know? you think there's there's also a way there yes if you were to do that yeah, it would just be more t- I'd say we say so you're saying you see some of this stuff as kind of an express way to do it to get there quicker yes but you know it's like I said it's not for everybody yeah. it's you can if your expectations are to get there to get there quicker, yeah, I can help you, can assist you, but you have mm-hmm. to, like, you have to, you have to integrate what you learn in your process. You can't just basically like do it one time, like, oh, I'm already there. Like, you keep some people, you see it very much in the plant medicine world. Some people keep on going back, like thinking, I'm going to get the answer. I want to, I want to be sure. Oh, the right, answer. right. As like, you're not integrating what you learn or like what it, it told you. Like, you need time to process and to integrate to. Um, to create those healthy habits to do so to become mm-hmm. a better person on a conscious level. Mm-hmm. And like any addict, you know, man, like you're depressed, you keep on going to the bar, you know, you hear something that goes on, keep on running the plant medicine. Like mm-hmm. that's not the right way to do it. Like you have all the answers already within you. Just kind of, you know, read a book, learn some, like process, like what's your point of view, do a three sixty round of emotion, like where's the root of this coming from? And so there it's you see, I see it a lot nowadays. A lot. I have some friends that just keep on going back to plant medicine. Keep on going back. Like, dude, you already have the answer. And it's like it's ready within you. But why you keep on going back? That it's, would be your problem, Frank. If I if you start going and I talk to the uh, the ayahuasca farm guy and I'm like, how's Frank doing? Jesus, he's been down here 13 times in six weeks. I don't, I don't yeah. think his wife love will the process. allow that. What's that? I don't think I don't think his, his wife will allow that. <laughs> <laughs> I got to think that's got to be the number one concern of anybody who does this sort of thing it from the 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 wife or the boyfriend or the girlfriend whoever the significant other is is that you're going to come back from the retreat and go well figured out the problem <laughs> it's you <laughs> you're the baggage <laughs> you know like like once like like once you know like you know you know you, you can't go back and, and sometimes yeah. you find that like you know that person sometimes some people have are not unhealthy relationship and so like that person is not for me mm-hmm. um always i have a friend who did this past time in peru who girlfriend wants to do it too but he's like let me do it by myself first like let our first time experience be separate for the fact that i have my own stuff to process mm-hmm. um yeah and he's like man like she's the one dude like she she's gonna be my wife one day like i see it in my past life we were married together um I, I, like he saw how he saw how ayahuasca was was like was made mm-hmm. created I share your story about one friend I went down there with, and um, his first time doing it. Now, how many times have you been on these? Um, I've, let's let's say ventures. how many times I've been, but let's see how many times I've done it. I've done Cambo eight times, and I've uh-huh. done ayahuasca about five or six times. In what period of time, roughly? Uh, I say within a, year. I think five five times within a year. Okay, so, so overall, you've been doing this a couple of years. Within yeah, a couple of years, I would say. Okay, yes. okay. Sorry, go ahead. No, I just no, kind of so, want to frame a reference. So, so I, I have a friend who, who, you know, grew up Jewish but was more atheist. And mm-hmm. um, he had a successful business. So one, one business kind of fell, but, you know, and it's, it's third cup because you had three servings of a cup. You go the first time, second time, or third time. And we're in Peru. He told me the next day, he's like, man, like, you know, Ruben, I, you know, I grew up Jewish in a Jewish household. Um, I was atheist, you know. Um, the third cup, man, like um, – I went into the body of Jesus Christ. Like, what? And it's like, yeah. I was like, I felt his crucifixion, like when he was crucified. Mm-hmm. Like, I understand what the meant. I, underst- I finally understand what it means to be selfless. I'm like, damn, bro, that shit's crazy as hell. <laughs> yeah. Like, just everybody has different lessons in life, and we just don't know what we're going to have. Like, my first experience, I felt all this dark energy in my stomach about love and relationships just released that wasn't mine. That was my parents, my sisters. My brothers, you know, I have four older sisters, 18, 17, 16, and 13 years apart. And I've seen different, I've seen the good, the bad, the ugly, and the worst, and, and relationships. And so my brother, older brother and little brother, too. So I had a lot of stuff that wasn't mine. And I, when I, my first ceremony, I was just purging. I was just laughing because I'm like, this stuff is not mine. Like, 
block let's let's get rid of the stuff that's is that isn't mine and um yeah it's like everybody everybody's experience your life experience is, is different than mine how you how you were brought up and you might have something that you need that needs to be released that's blocking you from being the best version of you but then again it's not for everybody to do it though mm-hmm. i want to see you do the combo just to see you not throw up <laughs> I have a nagging suspicion and you get why right instantly you knew why I'm saying that right they're gonna give it to you and be like alright you're gonna puke right and I'm like uh, me I might kill me if I can get all the toxins out of my ass uh, but you you're, you're gonna be like <coughs> that's oh. it oh, that's it that's all you had in you cause uh, Richard's never drank smoked done a drug like I mean well I mean have you ever had a surgery no Jesus Christ this guy's had no, nothing a- a- everybody has like you will purr, like everybody has something to release. And he's a vegan. Yeah. Everybody has something to yeah. release. No, I'm sure. You know, I'm pretty sure like your your childhood wasn't perfect and there's something you you hold oh, on there to. Oh, there we go. Oh, he yeah. now, wow, right off the I'd bat start, here. The I'd childhood. Start, I'd start vomiting up. You dad, almost got up and left the room. Bleh, no. Dad, dad, <laughs> bleh, dad. He has bleh, a, some father achiever. Yeah. Richard has some Don't more father like issues that. than some of the strippers here in town. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah. you know, you might have something that's not yours and just release it. And yeah. Whatever it might be, it's like those, those might be your intentions. Like, let this issues of my dad be released, and then mm-hmm. um, whatever comes out of it comes out of it. But the, when you do it the next day, you're like, man, what the hell? Next, you sleep and you feel good the next day. The first time I did, I was a lot more grounded, I was more yeah. connected, and I was like, man, like, this is uh, an interesting thing. See, okay, so, so that's, that's kind of interesting because if I, I could get the idea. Of going in and going, all right, you know, I want to like kind of, you know, let go of, you know, issues and frustrations I have with my dad, who's dead. He's been dead like, I don't know, 10 years, maybe something like that. Um, But, uh, you know, that, okay, I want to let go of some of that stuff, right? So then I, like you said, intention. So I get that in my head and then you go through that whole process. However, I actually, I mean, I, I really have very, like, cognitive, lucid thoughts of periodically I'll think to myself, fuck, if he was still here, I could do a better job of telling him off now than I could have 10 years. You know what I'm saying? Like, like fuck, now I didn't miss a chance to say that. That would have cut if I'd have thought of it, but I didn't think of it. You know, so I have those kinds of frustrations. You, you, you know, I'm... I'm not you, but I think I would disagree with you on that part. I think if you had an opportunity to do so, I think you just apologize. But then you just apologize, like you know, let's both be men. Let's mm. put this behind us and let's move forward in that dire- in a positive direction. He's not petting any other department. We got to give him this. Yeah. Richard has nothing else bad about no flaws. Like he needs something. Let's give him. Like, he holds on to it. Like, don't like, let it. No, no, not so, this. This he gets to be yeah. bad about. So, yeah. so like, like, like some people in ayahuasca would experience that. Like some yeah. people, like past lives or people who passed away um some people like they'll get they'll come to them and, yeah and, and that and like they're like whoa like they're here like you're done in your own head like mm-hmm. they're here um if you don't want to do ayahuasca there's a, a toad called the bufo toad you can go to like the sedona desert of mexico and it's about a 20 30 minute trip of just straight dmt and so you don't have to, there's no no purging no none of that it's just 20 30 minutes of just gone you're gone for about 20 you 30 minutes this toad or that no and that toad you is like it's secreted like the different glands and people like addicts do it too mm-hmm. like, they use it like so like for addicts back to the opiate addiction they use like albogene which is an african um an african met on um, plant medicine which i was informed that it helps 70 percent of addicts it helps break 70 percent of opiate addiction mm-hmm. which is a very high percentage rate to do they cost about ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars because nobody's gonna dra- fly to Africa and go into the jungle of, of Kenya, mm-hmm. wherever they might wherever they might go. But they do it in Canada and they do it in Mexico. Um, Albuquerque, Ayahuasca, San Pedro, Bufo. The that toad. looks like the toad from like Futurama. Yeah, so like they like like they secrete the glands. <laughs> you know here. what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> I just love that, that that Mikey's Sunday morning is just spent pulling up pictures of different kinds of toads on the internet, and putting them on our screen up here. Yeah. yeah. So this is the bo- the boat the bofo bofo bofo. 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 Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this this is the glands and um, yeah, and basically that you s- people smoke it and for twenty thirty minutes they're gone. But you mm-hmm. could do it in Mexico under a practitioner. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that poor dog was <laughs> tripping. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. Well, let me. Actually, let me bounce this idea off of you then. 
<clears throat> because are we going to Mexico? No, 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 no. We're not. We're not going to Mexico. Um, but uh, uh, let, me, let me bounce this concept off of you because, as Frank kind of just explained to you, like I'm a I'm very straight edge, right? So I don't when when Dan and, and Dan and I've had lengthy conversations about all this, right? The part that worries me, but it's not. I mean, I'm I'm a very like uh, uh, you know. All natural. This is eat. natural. No, that's what I'm saying. I am. I'm. I'm very much with all natural medicine, uh, nourishment, that sort of thing. So you don't have to sell me on that at all. Like I'm totally down with that. But I don't like any type of thing of losing control. So the idea of any kind of hallucinating is. I don't. I don't want that. And I don't, I don't, I never want anything that makes me feel out of control of myself and my immediate surroundings, right? So, but that's also the same thing that has kept me from ever drinking, ever doing drugs, any kind of thing like that. So, what do you think about the concept of I'm not trying to get to a place of strengthening will necessarily because I feel like I'm already there? So, maybe in my personal case, the thing that's going to make me resistant to doing anything that's going to make me hallucinate is the thing that has kept me from developing any kind okay. of chemical dependencies to begin I, with. I, I see what you mean. Um, so, let's say we use Cambo. Cambo is not an hallucinogenic. And yeah, it, right, it, right. it lasts 10, 20 minutes. So, I think your first experience will be Cambo because you won't lose control. You just, it's 10, 12 minutes of purging. Yeah. And I haven't gotten sick since I started doing it in two years. So, yeah. so for yourself, like, it's like, it's like getting the flu shot. Right, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it yeah. Was, do you get flu shots? Yeah, I have I have before. Yeah, I don't you, decide to do it regularly, yeah, but I have but, before. But you, but you take, like, you know, anti-inflammatories, Advil, Tylenol, stuff like that for your body when you get sick. If I have to, yeah. Yeah, see, I don't have to. Yeah. So, you know, you, you want to be more holistic, more natural. So yeah. I, will, I will go in the regards, like, try the Cambo. Yeah. See what you think. And I, I understand. Like I said, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's It's hallucinogenics are not for everybody I, mm -hmm. I didn't when i first did it I was like what i just do to my like what i just do I, i've mm -hmm. never done this before mm -hmm. um i said just give the cambo a shot and see how you feel afterwards and, yeah and that's more for your body in general uh so subconsciously if you like you know what when you're ready for it it'll it'll call you like th there'll be signs of like man like there's a lot of different signs you know like in front of the um downtown by by the courthouse all those cactus in front um not the courthouse, but right next to it, it's all San Pedro. It's all hallucinogenic cactus. Mm. I, f I found that pretty funny. I was mm. like, wow, the city. Yeah. Thing. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I did not know that. But then again, the reason I don't know that is because I have avoided having to go to the courthouse. <laughs> so maybe that's good. Maybe I'm on a good path. I want to not steer well, toward the you path. You avoid going there as a... Uh as a defendant. Right. You, you try going there as a, uh, a, a juror. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing, too. They, don't, they won't take me as a juror. See? So that's a whole other story. Uh, when I don't get picked for jury duty, it upsets me. No, but I understand what you mean. Yeah. Like, like I said, it's not for everybody. The different things, the way to do things. Mm -hmm. um, I'll definitely give Campbell a shot. There's, all, there's something that you're holding on to mm -hmm. that you that you have. You share that, you share that much. So... Mm -hmm. um, when you're ready for it, you're ready for it. You know, one day you might decide to just hop on the plane and go to Peru and like, yeah, you know. I would watch me do it and make fun of me. Right? Yeah, yeah. I would, I would go. My intentions with it, I would, I would go in and I would go, all right, I'm going to let myself off the hook that I don't have, I, I, I don't have to expect myself to be perfectly passive aggressive. Like, I did a good enough job of putting somebody in their place without always wishing I could go back for one last set you know what i'm saying you know you talk about one of the guys um the medicine guys there i don't like to use the word shaman um yeah it just i don't like like that word in general um the one the guy said that who led the last ceremony i was in peru um he said just remember that there's a beginning and there's the end nobody's ever died from it and so we don't oh, uh -huh. and yeah. so like we talk about losing control like there's a beginning and there's an end to it yeah. like it's okay you're, you're going to be fine mm -hmm. um and it goes back to your your intentions, mm -hmm. and you're going to be okay mm -hmm. whenever you're ready to let that open up that part of yourself. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who did it first time ever doing anything like hallucinogenic. She did it, and within like three minutes, she just passed out and threw up on herself. And I'm like, 
she's by herself like like in a ceremony i'm like what happened to you she's like man that that released a lot of stuff like being dependent on people and you know we call her we call her queen p uh cause she's like a queen and that it, it was interesting to see like she didn't like losing control either yeah and she let that control go and just overtook her but there was a beginning and there was an end and she released things that wasn't even hers a lot of stuff she's like i never knew there was so much stuff holding me down like uh-huh. so much like stuff that was holding me down from being me from being authentic you know there's a there's a there's a better version of you inside you yeah and, and you know that answer yeah yeah well i also think that extreme situations cause people to fo- it's like when you get a health scare for example, like, you know, you're not just on a random day thinking about all of the saturated fats that you're eating or something like that until you have a minor heart attack, you know, and then everything is you're really spending a lot of time focusing on what you probably shouldn't be doing. So not to draw a literal comparison there, but I'm also thinking that, you know, if we if we go to a remote place and we do this thing that's going to cause this physical reaction, boy, talk about not being distracted by much else. You know, we're going to be very focused on what could I be doing differently and better, I would think. So that might be a benefit, too. What I guess we should answer the, the all-important question before we wrap up this segment, though. Where does the, uh, the Cambo frog sit with USADA? Because that's the uh, that's the thing any MMA fighter is going to need to know. You know, you saw the governing body. That, I don't have to worry about it anymore. So. Well, uh, yeah, that's the. Uh, do you, um, do you it, know anything about like? Does that sort of I, thing come up in drug um, tests? No, man. It's like it's illegal. It's a natural anti-inflammatory. You're not. In, it's a natural medicine that is is produced in the body. I mean, I don't know what the regulations are for it, but I'm yeah. pretty sure that uh, is detoxify the body it will clean any type of junk you have in the body and it's legal i right. mean you're, you're releasing things. well i know but i mean the problem with them sometimes is and in other governing organizations is a lot of times it's not just legal versus illegal they'll have things they'll have completely legal over-the-counter things that they'll they'll consider you banned put, substances you, you, you put poison you put poison in your body and you want to purge i don't think they don't like you put you put poison in your body what like oh gonna, i i know i know i mean I, this is how the hearing will go but the thing is they may still uh, suspend you for a year. So I, I'm just curious as far as like, do you know if that sort of thing, like can I test, could I test you at some point and tell that you did the Cambo, I wonder? Uh, no way. I don't, I don't think there, I don't think there just is. just doesn't I, if you want to test, register. If you want to test me on Wings Day and find out, you know, we can go ahead and do that. I'll be open for that. I'll, I'll yeah. do it Tuesday. Yeah. And that, you're going to do it on Tuesday in, in afternoon or evening and do a drug test. Like, hey, let's see if the Kimbo pops up. Yeah. I don't know what type of test we have to take exactly. Well, I'll bet you got to order that through walgreens.com. I'll <laughs> bet they don't carry, they don't stock it in store. I need the Cambo test. Like, yeah. Whatever, whatever you saw to, uh, you know, drug test policy is we we, yeah. we could try that and see what happens, but I highly doubt that that's going to pop up. We know we, we can get my friend Tashara, who's a Kimbo practitioner, and she could she has more answers to yeah, that yeah. stuff that she could yeah. tell you about. Yeah. Um, but I thought about that. I highly doubt that though. Yeah. You put frog poison in your body, okay? Yeah, that's natural. It's like it's like put it's like taking Advil, but better and stronger. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It doesn't doesn't necessarily seem like a, a short term performance enhancer. Yeah, and it's like DMT is like DMT is producing your body naturally. Yeah, it's like you know, it's not as it's not like testosterone. You're not like yeah, wow, wow, you have an extraordinary amount of DMT that was produced recently. Um, yeah, what happened? You know, I almost died recently. I was and DMT was produced in, on a on subconscious level state, or I was yeah. in, I had a very deep REM sleep and DMT was released. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. This could make for some really interesting first date conversation. You know what I'm saying? Have you been in that situation before? First date? Like, well, everybody's had a well, first yeah, date. Actually, but it, well, that's, like, how, that's how I've been my girlfriends. Like, you oh, know, you did? Yeah. You guys met in the well, sort of the culture? Uh, well, yeah. I was like, do the culture. I was like, I want to do Cambo. And my friend was like, hey, go talk to that girl. And I was like, okay. And then that same weekend, I went to her house, did Cambo, and just got a number and stayed in touch. And oh. eventually ended up dating. 
Interesting. And we're dating right now, so yes, we met. This Relationship frog. through narcotics. I wonder if that. Yeah, well, I wonder if there's some guy. Some, some people who are probably well, like. Most of you us know, do that. It's just a little bit different. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, Frank, uh, you know what? You know your your intentions. What do you bring with it? You'd be like, oh no, I cleared all that up two years ago. Now I'm just here to meet the girls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be very that wouldn't be right it'd be unethical you, you, don't you know, do that you know I, i've i have uh, before we uh, we finish yeah. um you know i have a friend who who who's that well friend's dad who said he sat with a uh, barbara streisand like twice a year she sits with with the medicine mm. ayahuasca and mm-hmm. um she, yeah, she informed that who she sat was with, with was walt disney mm. and so a lot of creative minds have really dipple dabbled into I can see that. Sure. that. And so but didn't like um this guy from like Apple, they said like you should try LSD and stuff like that. Like when mm-hmm. your mind once your mind is open, like unlocked, those areas are unlocked, as you mentioned before, like mm-hmm. you get some multi million dollar, billion dollar ideas of, of things you could do. Um, but those are not your intentions. It all comes to you. I have I have, I have ideas of writing kids' books a certain way and I've I've the ceremony has taught me like what I need to do and I mm-hmm. have everything I need to do. I just gotta Finish out that task in doing so, mm-hmm. um, but I was like, okay, but you know what? Disney, Disney owns ES- ESPN. Disney owns a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, what Disney's has done it. Barbara Streisand has done it. People on that different level have yeah. have done different type mm-hmm. of medicine. So, but their intentions were probably in the right way. It's not to escape reality. Yeah, it's never to escape reality. Learn to is what we learn the like what we learn and how to integrate and process that information that's given to us to become a better version of ourselves. I like this idea the the psychedelic children's author. Have you have you have you actually started writing? I, kids I books? actually have it, and I actually like I for some people like like I some three like three books. I have to uh, go back and re-edit it. Um, and everybody I talk to are like, man, dude, you're onto something. And it's like, and I have an idea what to do with it. And then at the day is like. 10% will go to kids, like not non-profit kids. I want to create non-profit uh, mm-hmm. down the road, but just help kids who are less fortunate. For me, I, I, I'm a the medicine. So I mean, Ruben, you're a humanitarian. You're always, you, you, my passion is working with kids. It's like I love working with kids and aspect that. It's not the income, which you make. It's the outcome and how you shape their lives, what they become. And hopefully you give them the tools necessary to become a better version of themselves um, and, and give them the information necessary. Like if it's fruits and vegetables or if it's uh, how you perceive something, your, like your mind sight, your mindset and how you look at life. You know, that's how it, that's, that's what it comes down to. I, I tell my girlfriend, it's not the income of what I make. It's the outcome of a kid's life, and what they become as man and, 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 and as as women and when they become parents, because I know that we're not perfect. And I'm here just to share my life experience and just give advice and what they use with it. That's that's their own choice. Yeah, I, I think that's good philosophy. I I, uh, I, I, I like this um, this very introspective aspect of uh, of uh, what you're bringing here, being introduced into Frank's camp. This is like the yin and yang of Angelo Reyes. This is like the uh, you have you met Angelo yet? I haven't. Oh boy, I meet him tomorrow. Yeah, he's he's a great guy, but he is Mister Personality. Like I'm just imagining Angelo, you know the 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 uh, the the extrovert, you know the the bombastic personality on one side, and then we got Ruben over here on the other, and then I'm imagining the walk in to uh where you know you like the the arena walk in where you got like the whole camp and then just one green frog <laughs> under somebody's uh somebody's uh arm you're gonna have to have a spot in your backpack for it yeah right? of course yeah yeah i'm, I'm the backpack guy so no nah, nah, you, you leave the frog in the amazon where it belongs in the natural habitat you know you don't harm you don't want to harm the frog and okay see there that's sorry know, now i'm we'll down with you there frog. too yeah absolutely. we can have a symbolic frog would be would be nice yeah yeah. All right. That was fun, man. Hey, did, did you want to tell, like, I don't know if you want to publicize it, but, like, do you want to <coughs> tell people where to find you online or I don't know if oh, yeah, you do you, social media or yeah, anything? Yeah, you can follow me on, on, on Instagram as Ruben, R E U B E N, Chavez, C H A V E Z 711, um, as my Instagram page. Um, right now it's private, but sometimes I put it public here and there. So for the next couple, 48 hours, I keep it public. Mm-hmm. You know, whoever wants to follow me. Um, I'm an introvert, extrovert, might be 60, 40. Uh, introvert and 40 percent extrovert depending mm-hmm. on what i'm around um i enjoy my privacy in that sense that the fact that i like to be work on myself you know mm-hmm. and don't take on people's baggage and your shit yes um yeah you can follow me um i work with frank uh 
I also use a, a high roller. I let you borrow like the last three or four days is a new product that I, I, I kind of caught myself uh, looking into and got sponsored by. But it really works out the hamstrings, people who have tight hamstrings, mm -hmm. um, calves in different parts of the body. Okay, you roll out, right? Yeah. Okay, what he's describing is going to be hard to describe on air. Yeah. Maybe I should bring it upstairs. Yeah, but when we're done tonight, he'll bring it over there. Like It's something I'm going to get one now because he let me borrow for a couple days. Yeah. Bella loves it. It's a way to finally use the roller on your hamstrings where it just doesn't really work very well to use yeah. a regular foam roller on the ground. I, I never get a good hamstring yeah. rollout. It's good for the you know the IT band and good for your quads. But this thing, because it comes up off the ground, way better. You'll see it, no, once, I, I once it brings it out of the car. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I, I, learned, I learned it to the PT place and the PT office loved it. Like, man, like this. And the thing is, like, it works deep into the hamstring by your, by your buttocks. And a lot of people on a subconscious level, like man or woman, like when a guy or a female, whoever works on you, um, feel like wow like this is they're too close to my genitalia area mm. and so like yeah man you're kind of close right there bro mm -hmm. so this actually works you, where you can I actually do, it yourself. do that thing where i kind of move closer you know it kind of <laughs> wiggle i make them uncomfortable that's why i figure when i yeah. drop my underwear it gives sure. you the, the green light that's right <laughs> touch that's my a, butt buddy they touch knew what butt. they were getting into all right ruben thanks for coming in spending sunday morning with us anytime man thank you all right great meeting you frank joining us in the bent pixel studios right now is brad smuckler who is for purposes of uh, this segment and life. this show yes <laughs> an mma accountant this yes. is the guy who handles the frank Mir taxes he does well he worked for the ufc for many years and that's where he gained a lot of experience on how to deal with specifically fighters and uh you know a lot of fighters we just don't know we really don't there's not a lot yeah. of classes when you're in high school saying all right you know they teach you how to do arithmetic but then no one wants to teach you how to do taxes you know and uh i tried doing like what everybody else does go down to h and r block you know and you go in there and they start looking through the, the the income of a, a fighter and as far as write-offs are included as far as foreign income coming in they look at you like you're speaking chinese you're probably the first cage uh, cage fighter right. they've seen that so day. i mean yeah. maybe if i went to an entertainment uh yeah a, a cpa You'd be or getting tax, closer they yeah i think they might understand me more but even within that realm mm -hmm. they don't specialize in fighters so that's where brad who comes in was an invaluable asset to anybody who's making an income as a professional fighter well brad first of all welcome to the show it's thank you much you. Thank and you, I, Frank. I i have to tell you that uh my mother uh who is uh my accountant and is going to be so excited that after all these years in radio and podcasting, uh, we've booked an accountant as a guest. I, is, I could just imagine, Richard. Yeah, this, she probably will be, truly. This may be her all-time favorite um, segment. Uh, it's is, extremely important, yeah. man. I, don't, I cannot stress, and we'll go through this, and I'll probably hit it about four or five times, how important it is to have someone like Brad mm -hmm. taking care of you as a fighter it's nightmares if you don't i mean everybody knows you, you, you the only thing two things required of you right you're going to die and you're going to pay taxes yeah and so many fighters and myself included eh, we blow it off we're like oh i'll worry about it next year or i'm doing an okay job at it or i think i'm doing it right because it's very confusing yeah and uh if you don't do the right thing trust me dude i've been there i've had the irs knock on my door a couple years back it will catch up to you. Yeah. Well, let's do this, uh, uh, Brad, if I can, just as kind of a point of entry on the conversation, because I think a lot of MMA fans uh, would be very interested to know, putting themselves in the shoes of the MMA fighter for a second, what are the things I would need to look out for as a fighter? So let's imagine for a second that on opposite ends of the table here, you've got Frank Mir playing himself, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, is is a legend. And let's say you got me, who's a new fighter. I'm playing actually for this exercise. I'm going to play much younger than I actually yes. am. You're okay. going to be making your debut as a professional. Right, exactly. Okay. So, so I have never had to do any MMA accounting before, but now I'm going to be collecting my first paycheck, and I've taken the sage advice of my mentor frank Mir here and i'm going to get started off on the right foot so right off the bat what are the things i need to look out for when i collect my first paycheck well richard i'm guessing at this point you've made it to where you're either in bellator or ufc and now you're going to get more than two thousand dollars for your fight that's what they promised me okay good so if you're making pretty decent money now you want to make sure that you're going to use a bank account mm -hmm. or a credit card to pay everything so that at least you have a trail of everything you're spending money on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Beyond that. Uh, when you say everything, what what are the things I should be keeping track of? Well, so what you be sh you should be keeping track of would be paying your coaches, paying your managers, um, auto expense, 
you've got because your vehicle is important for you getting to and from the gym. Absolutely, okay. that's the tool that gets you to and from, mm-hmm. and so it's a it's a write off. Right. So so is now my mother always uh, prefers that I write off uh, miles versus uh, like a tank of gas because the miles will end up paying more. So I can ca- keep a little mileage log. Is that what mm-hmm. you'd like me to do? Nope, I, I don't even ask for that. Oh, okay. Instead, I create the mileage log for you. Oh, nice. Um, it's the distance between the two gyms. My mom didn't right. do that. So I'm going to say, well. She's going to well, have to step up her game. In, in MMA, MMA it's a learn something. I've never listened to this episode. Yeah, <laughs> yeah in, in MMA, it's a little different because yeah. – I know from all my experience working for UFC and working with the fighters and, and now doing this for about a year and a half, mm. I realize that you've got a habit. Your habit is you get up in the morning mm-hmm. and you go to practice or you go to train. After you train, you either come home. So I'll call it gym number one. You go to gym mm-hmm. number one in the morning, you train for a while, you go home. Mm-hmm. Then after you go home, you go to back to gym number one or you go to gym number two. Mm-hmm. Then after gym number two, you might go over to gym number three or go home go back to gym number one again. Or Wednesdays, you might go to striking gym. Thursdays, you go to your jiu-jitsu gym. You've got different places that you go to. All deductible. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, tell me, Richard, how many days a week do you go? How many times do you go? And we're Mm going to figure out how many miles it was each way. Okay. We're going to add it all up, how many weeks you're gone, and it's pretty pretty easy. Now Mm -hmm. we create a mileage log. Then we ask you about, okay, do you go hiking? Do you go biking? Do you go um, swimming or running? Mm-hmm. Do you have to drive to get there? Mm-hmm. So tell me about all those trips. So maybe if I do my road work up at uh, Red Rock Canyon, I could deduct the distance I have to drive to get there. And back. Absolutely right. Got it. Okay. Well, okay. And to start off even a step back further real quick, for fans at home that aren't fighters, they don't realize that, that when a fighter fights – um, we get a check written to us. The company itself never takes taxes out mm. uh, if you're fighting domestically. Right. They just, here, if, you, if you're promised $2,000, you're going to get a check for two grand, and it's up to you to take care of all those taxes. And this is where the beginning of the end pretty much happens for That's most young guys yes. and women now. Yes. Uh, they get a check like, oh, $2,000. Like, whereas if most people work and they have you know, a W-9 type situation where yeah. they have a, a, someone who taxes out for them, now it's up to you to get your money back, make sure mm-hmm. it's correct on what you're being taxed. But for us, they just give us the full amount. Yeah. So so when I get so when I get my check and I've been I've been keeping my miles, so mm-hmm. that's one thing I've been watching. Okay. Uh, I've been uh, putting everything on credit cards or saving receipts. So like uh, I assume like anything from uh, uh, gym gear that I may be paying for out of pocket. Anything related to what you do. Uh, that anything that you had to get mm-hmm. to make yeah. sure that you didn't lose yeah. teeth. Yep. Supplements. Pads, pads that, supplements. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. So I've kept track of all that. Okay. So now uh, I've gotten my my check. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, what do I want to do with that immediately before I uh, go on my luxury vacation? Probably put about 25% away. Okay, yes. As for taxes. Okay. And that, that's, that's an important thing. Yeah. Like, everybody screws that up. In fact, I do it a little bit differently now. Well, you should do more than 25. Yeah, well, I, I send 40% right to the IRS right off the bat. Yeah. You're supposed to pay quarterly but I have found that there's been difficulties sitting on a large sum of money in a bank account sure. and, and not finding spending. a reason for it to come out. You yeah. know, like, oh, okay, well, oh, shit, the car, or the transmission went. Yeah. Uh, there's a thousand bucks. Yeah. Well, well, you just pull it from, you know, Peter, you know, and yeah. you know, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. And then before you know it, when it's time to give that estimated tax, you're a couple grand shy because you've been pulling because it's just sitting there. And I think that's a problem that a lot of fighters have. We'll, we'll try to put the money to the side. But as time wears on, like any other human being, we, pull from it and then we shouldn't it's there it's available right so on my low end Mm -hmm. i've uh you're saying set my 25 percent aside so i do that so really i should be of the mindset that if i was making that two thousand dollars i was really only making 1500 i should just kind of imagine 25 percent of that gone right away we're way ahead of the game okay (laughs) so let's say i've done that and now uh what do you do where I've said, uh, okay, Brad, I got my, my 25% set aside, and, of course, you have all my re- receipts and logs and everything. Uh, what, do you, what do you do at that point? So, first of all, I'm going to talk to you and say, Richard, if you've only made 2000 a year, then your expenses are going to offset it. You have no issue. Yeah. Okay. But let's say you made twenty or forty or sixty or 300000 or some larger number. Now, I'm going to take all your expenses. I'm going to tabulate them figure out what type of things you've spent money on because you're going to give me your 
your information from your bank account. Mm-hmm. You're going to give me your information from your credit card. And some people pay cash. There's a problem with paying cash. If you lose your receipt, you lost your yeah. deduction. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So don't pay cash. That's why I said use the bank card, use the credit card. A lot of people don't like credit cards because they spend money. It's like, to Frank's point, it's like money in the bank that they don't have. Yeah. They start mm-hmm. spending it. They get upside down. So I don't really say, hey, if, if you don't have a credit card, you don't need to have one. Mm-hmm. Use a bank card. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, so, And one advice you actually gave me was to actually have two accounts, your personal account, and then have your business account as a fighter, right. and know that whenever you use your debit card from your business account, use that mm-hmm. for when you're paying for gas, when you're buying something that's, that you already know is fight-orientated. Yeah. So that way it's much easier for Brad to look through there because you know if I'm buying movie tickets out of the same account that I'm buying a mouthpiece out of, you have to sit there and go, okay, well, no, what was this charged for? Well, this right. was for this. Right. This was for that. And you can save yourself a lot of time and of sitting down there because, you know, Brad works by I the hour. charge by the hour, right? Yeah, yeah, so you could try to save yourself a little bit of headache by separating the two. Makes sense. Okay, mm-hmm. so I've, I've done that. I've created two separate accounts, and one account is strictly – uh, business. So if Brad sees that's a charge easy, on that ledger, then he knows that's uh, uh, career related. Correct. Okay? All right. Yep. So so I've done that. Uh, what would you tell me as far as I mean the I know the mileage deduction. Uh, I know the training expenses. Is there any kind of deduction that a fighter has that always seems to kind of surprise them that they didn't know would be included in things they could write off? It's a great point. Uh, home office is one. Mm. How does that work? So I have three bedrooms in my house. I have a living room, a dining room, and a kitchen. Okay. So my house is six rooms. Ignore the bathrooms Mm -hmm. and the laundry room. And so if one of those, I've got all my athletic training equipment. I might have a mat in there. Also in the garage, I'm using half of the garage to store gear, put my work vehicle And so half my garage is business. Mm. One of my rooms in the house is business. So it's easy enough to figure out a portion of your house should all be business. So utilities, your mortgage, your insurance, your property tax, uh, cable TV, a lot of those common expenses – we're going to deduct a part of that. Okay. Well, that was something interesting, actually, that he had talked to me about. That, I, But it, it came also to, I remember you told me there was two things. We can either go by bedrooms mm-hmm. or by square footage. And you looked at it. There was like, an, like, I was like, oh, okay, so it depends. Some people have a very large house, right? same amount of bedrooms, or sometimes you have a smaller house, more bedrooms. Mm-hmm. And it came down to kind of figuring out which one actually benefited That's you. That's right. And, you, and I've now done done this for, I don't know, over 100 fighters, hmm. UFC, MM, uh, Bellator people mostly. And of those people, I've looked in almost every time their accountant has used the square footage method hmm. only because that's what's on the IRS form. Mm-hmm. I use the rooms method or the square footage, but the rooms method is usually gives a lot better result. They save a lot more money. If you're in a smaller place as a general rule of thumb, would it be better to use the bedroom uh, metric? Or am I, do I have it backwards? It, it, no, it or does can, it even it can matter? Go both ways. It okay. Can go both ways. Okay. Yeah. All right. Interesting. So home office that makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense. Uh, you mentioned cable TV. Right. Now this is something that I do uh, because we obviously talk about uh, mm-hmm. mixed martial arts on this show. Mm-hmm. So I write off my ten dollar a month UFC Fight Pass membership. Correct. And uh, I write off uh, uh, other. Uh, oh, we purchase uh, a pay per view. That yeah, we we you know buy a pay per view. That's, right. That's a business related. expense right. exactly. Mm-hmm. So and it's you, not entertainment. It's dues and subscriptions. Right. Because you're subscribing to a TV show. Exactly. I don't even like it. I don't yeah. even like I don't even like having to do any of this. It's uh it's <laughs> it's just my lot in life. Um yeah, so okay, so so that makes a lot of sense. Um what about when a fighter transitions from uh, the role I'm playing, you know, my little two thousand dollar first check, mm-hmm. and I'm ascending up toward the the MMA heavens where Frank Mir sits up there, as I'm making my climb. What are the adjustments that we're going to have to make from the way you set me up? Now I'm, I'm headed in Frank's direction. What are the, the, the next level things I have to start watching so, for? So it's interesting to question in that, you know, there's different entities. Um, when I worked at the UFC, a lot of times people would come to me and say, hey, 
I want to get paid through my corporation or I want to be paid through my LLC. I right. thought this. He, t- he explained this to me. Yeah. And I'd okay. say, Everybody well, thought this was a smart idea until he explains the self-employment okay. tax. And I'd okay. say, well, why are you doing that? And they'd say, well, because my manager said I should do that. And they're making uh, 100000 a year, and which is good. But when you factor in 20% for managers and coaches and, and taxes and everything else, by the time it's the money's left over, they're not making much money. Right. Not on a hundred grand. Yeah. So it's not time to, to create an LLC because you don't have enough left in your pocket after training expenses to really buy a lot of assets to protect yourself. Mm. An LLC or a corporation of some sort protects you with some against some legal liability. Right. If it gives sued. different layers of protection. So it does. Someone goes after me if I own my house outright. Easier to get to if my house is owned by my corporation. There's another layer. Right. Or if what Frank did was as, uh, let's see, gosh, he's performing as a company instead of him individually, mm-hmm. then now they have to go after the corporation. Mm, okay. Corporation doesn't own the house in in current, but in Frank's example, they would own the house, right? Okay. Right. I mean, yeah. so, but like there are people as they rise into the ranks, they invest, maybe they buy houses, right, for rental properties. Mm-hmm. Maybe Back they buy cars. a gym or cars, and they start having all these possessions. Well, you don't want to get sued and lose them, so now it's good to have you're working as a company, mm-hmm. and that other stuff is apart from the company. Okay, right. So so that would be something I would need to consider as I, as I build upwards. Correct. Um, Once you start building up the, for assets, but I thought that I could use it better for tax write-offs. Yeah. Like, oh, I'll just make this the business, and then I can pay Jennifer because when she goes with me, she does so much work for me, anyways. Yeah. She's basically my management. She know, is my yeah. assistant. You know. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, I could use these as write-offs. But then I was explained the self-employment tax. Mm, basically, right. the first hundred. Oh man, the first what hundred thirty thousand I make almost. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get taxed an additional fifteen point three. Three yeah. percent on. Mm-hmm. Then once yeah. I break that barrier, it's two point two point nine. Two point mm-hmm. nine. Now, if I pay myself and then pay Jennifer, yeah. both of us have to pay that self employment tax on the first hundred and thirty, you know, odd. Right. Run. So now we're going up to two hundred sixty thousand dollars. I'm getting taxed at the high rate. rate. Yeah. So I, when he told me that, I was like, uh, so now my corporation. I'm like, yeah, that that that's that was bad advice. It's <laughs> it's funny that you you bring this up because uh, and and again my. My mother is, is smiling as she listens to this as a loyal subscriber to our podcast because this conversation actually came up between uh, Frank and I early on in doing the podcast and uh-huh. I'm not won't put all of our business out yeah. there, but just speaking in general terms, yeah. we were talking about we're not you know making a lot of money uh, at this point, but as revenue did start to come in, mm-hmm. and of course we were having grows. sponsorships, we were having expenses because we were buying gear and all that sort of thing, we were getting it all set up. So I, I have an LLC, and we were talking about the best ways to you know, track it all, pull anything out. Right now, Frank and I just put everything back into the show. But, you know, we're kind of having that philosophical, fundamental mm-hmm. conversation. And Frank brought that very thing up. Mm-hmm. He said, well, you know, should I be a like an employee of the the corporation? And then, you know, all the money goes through. And it's funny because I brought that up to my mom and then she fainted. And then I had to, to fan her for a while to bring to revive her, to bring her back because she – said the same thing of what Brad is saying. She was like, oh, no, the, the self-employment tax is going to kill you at that point. And, it will. And yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's if it were just the two of us with no guidance no. whatsoever setting this up, there's no, no telling where we'd go. Wrong. No, without somebody like a Brad, it'd be like yeah. trying to go learn jiu-jitsu without a coach. Yeah. You're just, I mean, you're going to take a lot of lumps and a lot of beatings. Right. And maybe you could pick up some experience, but, I mean, why, why go that route? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now, Brad, I'm going to uh, shift into a different role. Okay. Now, I'm not a fighter who just made their debut for $2,000. I'm a fighter who's been fighting a good little while. Maybe mm-hmm. I've been fighting five or six years. Right. And I've made some some good money. Turns out I haven't been wise with my investments. And when they gave me all that money, I didn't set aside my 25%. What do you think? That's about 80% of the uh, <laughs> MMA fighters? It's, it's a big chunk. It's have you met chunk. this guy? Have you met this guy? I, I have that I'm okay. There's more of those okay. guys than the yeah. guys that do it the right yeah. way. Yeah. Right. So I come to you, and maybe I have a scary letter I got from the IRS, mm-hmm. and I've basically got you know four or five years worth of making pretty good money and not doing anything no with it. tax returns right, right right what do we do first 
Leave the country. <laughs> <laughs> you it are now Cuban. They're knocking on your door. <laughs> yeah. So, so realize that IRS can be relentless. They start sending letters. They don't call you. Yeah. They send letters. We're close to California. California, same way. They're relentless. They will garnish your bank account. Yeah. I mean, they, they will take the money. But back to what you're asking. Oh, yeah, because you just touched on there. People don't realize – as a fighter, even though I live in Las Vegas, right? Yeah. When I go fight in California, the income I received for that fight, even though I was only there for a couple nights, I have to pay California state taxes on Whoa. that income. Absolutely. Yeah. So really, just as to hold your thought, I don't get you off track, Brad, but that sounds like as a rule of thumb then. You want to fight in uh, Vegas. Yeah, I should fight in uh, Nevada, Texas. Florida. Florida. Absolutely. Yeah. State You're absolutely and, right. and I should take that into consideration when I negotiate that, you know, I will actually come 100%. out better ahead for fighting in those states. Mm-hmm. So when I'm, I'm negotiating my terms with the company, if it's, if it's, you know, pretty close, whether I take one fight or the other, I should take that into consideration. Yep. And, and Richard, that's a great point. And where it really comes into play is not just in the U.S., yeah. but like bellator and ufc they're all over the world yeah. oh yeah and so you've got international taxes and australia crushes you hmm. i tax- lost more than half my money just by fighting in australia australian oh. taxes yeah. oh over 50 percent. you oh my gosh yeah. so yeah. when they handed me my paycheck because the ufc set aside because they realized fighters brad actually had set that up to where yeah. you know, a lot of fighters don't pay their taxes right off yeah. the bat they don't know so they don't want to get caught by surprise so the ufc went ahead and pulled the amount already when they hand you the check yeah and my check was for less than 50% of what was on my contract. Wow. Before I even came home and I had to start worrying about the U.S. managers, yeah. trainers. But that's something you got to consider. Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. so, so, so I've come to you, Brad, five years of, of uh, dereliction of uh, accounting there, and I'm scared, and I got the IRS letters. Help me, Brad. Okay. You're my only hope. So you're going to give me a copy of the letter. I'm going to have you fill out a power of attorney so I can get information from the IRS. Uh, you're also going to give me a letter where I can talk to either Bellator or your promoter, or UFC, and say, tell me your income, tell me mm-hmm. your expenses. And so first thing I'm going to do is we're going to say, okay, how do you spend your money? Do you spend it through a bank account? Do you spend it through a credit card? Do you spend it on cash? And then we're going to go and try and recreate 2017, 2016. Work backwards. 2015. A right? forensics. Those are the easiest ones because okay. – it's a lot of banks. I'm not really making a plug for Wells Fargo here, but uh-huh. when you download their transactions, you get 18 months. And if you do it right, you can get it. You can sort it by is it meal or auto or oh. training or utilities. It sorts it out for you. Yeah. So it's really nice. Whereas a lot of the banks, they're not like that. But so other than and, that, and the good news is because I have all those habits of a fighter, you mm-hmm. can probably detect my habit patterns absolutely forensically. Okay, I could algorithm. Tell, yep, yeah, I could tell your your living algorithm. Yeah, is. right. Okay, so, so we're gonna okay. do that. So okay. we're gonna grab that, and then what? What's unfortunate is some of the fighters, I end up with just pictures of bank statements, and we have to take those bank statements, actually right next to them, or you'd have to write next to them what kind of money it was for. Was it for training supplies? You went to Dick's Sporting Goods, so it was obviously gear. Mm-hmm. Um, you went to a restaurant or a bar. I can't tell if it was a business meal. So mm-hmm. you need to list all your stuff and name it, mm-hmm. what it is. And for me to do that and to do it accurately, I have to get with you. It could take maybe a couple hours a month, believe it or not, mm-hmm. or an hour and a half a month. Mm-hmm. So you got how many months do we say? Four years, five years? Yeah, about five years. Yeah, so it's it's really pricey. So yeah. Getting the stuff from 17, 16, 15, working backwards is best, easy to get. Mm-hmm. Now I can also, I can contact the IRS and get something called transcripts. Mm-hmm. So transcripts have all your W-2s, your 1099s, um, any kind of income, but they don't have the state information. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I Just can get on the those federal level. On the federal level, yep. So I can grab that and then we can go, we can have that information to create a tax return, mm-hmm. or we can go to like, uh, I'll use Invicta. So it's real easy to get a 1099 from Invicta for 16 and 17, but you go back prior years and it might take a while. Mm. Same thing with Bellator, same thing with UFC, a lot of these places, because it's not handy. Yeah, okay. okay. So, so we're gonna do that. Now you're gonna talk to the IRS 
And will they, I mean, obviously this is going to take a little time. It's going to be easier to find the last couple of years than, than four and five years ago. Mm-hmm. Will they be, in in terms of a good faith gesture, will they at least acknowledge the fact that I we're trying to do the right thing here and get all this sorted out? Do they, and maybe it depends on the agent that you get, but. In the beginning, they will. Better that we're coming to them, maybe. Right. Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. Now, the fact that, that point, you have an accountant okay. that actually has experience does. I have that. That'll make it. If a you talk to them directly, yeah. like you're trying to figure it out, they're mm-hmm. not going to have much respect for that. The minute you have someone like a Brad come in, mm-hmm. then they know that he knows the lingo, knows what the, the layout of the land is, and they see that you're taking it seriously. Yeah, okay. And I've had an example a few recently where if they owed over 50000 they come in and they start putting liens on your property. Yeah. If you have property. And nobody wants that to happen. Yeah. So the, the key is work with them the best you can. And then they do have uh, – there's a way of negotiating with them. Mm-hmm. And getting settlements. Some offer people, and compromise. Yep, right. Offer and compromise. Mm-hmm. Some people have had success with that. But if you're making a lot of money and you just haven't paid your taxes, they're not really anxious to settle yeah. on a lower price. Kate, will you be able to advise me as we go through that potential settlement process? This is a good deal. Maybe ask for this. Yes. Can you, you can help me with all that? Sure. Okay. And then now let's say we agree to those uh, payments that, that we've we've uh, mediated this with the IRS and I've got my payment set up. But I don't know if you've caught on to this uh, yet, Brad, with my, my uh, character I'm playing, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm historically irresponsible. So now I have to be responsible for making these payments right. in a way that it's, I wasn't it's before. It's called auto payment. Okay. So right. it just hits your account every month. Yeah. And if you don't have money in there when it hits, now you've got a problem. Okay. So you're going to suggest that I set up my auto payment and that when I get my fight checks, they just they just go in there. We get hit with the auto pay. The money comes right out. Mm-hmm. It's not sitting there waiting for me to figure out a way to spend it, that Correct. sort of thing. That's right. Okay. Very good. Um, is there anything that you have to draw a line at where now you know you've endeared yourself to me so much you've gotten me out of all this hot water and that sort of thing uh boy i would just like it if uh you could just be my dad you know like i mean do you have to then go okay i i can do so much for you Uh but you still have to be responsible for a b and c i'm gonna at this point i'm gonna help you i'm gonna give you baby steps i'm gonna Mm. go slow with you I'm going to help you any way you need it, mm-hmm. okay? Anyway, I can go, you know, I can do most of the work. I can do a little bit of the work. I'm going to encourage you to do most of the work, mm-hmm. but I'm going to help you any way I need to. Um, you know, one of the problems for the people you just described in your role playing is go back four or five years ago, they go, oh, shoot, I paid cash. So guess what? What's deductible if you pay cash and you have no receipts? Okay. Not a whole lot. Right. So yeah. So yeah. we go to plan B. Mm-hmm. Plan B is, well, okay, so let's create a mileage log mm-hmm. and let's figure out all the miles you got because we can multiply them by roughly 50-something cents a mile. Right. So if you drove 20,000 miles, there's a $10,000 deduction, mm-hmm. a little more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, then we're going to – I I've, I create a travel log, and some people go to their Instagram page, some go to their Facebook, oh. and they see where they're at. And then I look at Wikipedia and say, hey, you fought here and here and here over these five years. And so that'll help recollect where you've been. Yeah, because I got knocked out a couple times. I forgot where I fought. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) So you can help me with that. It happens. (laughs) So now you got this log and we go, wait a minute. You were out of the country or out of the state, rather, or away from home overnight for these days for business. We're going to take roughly $55 a day for food. Oh, yes. So per diem. Yes. You can deduct that. You can't deduct the hotel if you're self-employed, but you can deduct your estimated food costs. Okay. So now you've got the food costs. You've got the mileage. It's better than zero. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. What else do you have that we can go with? I would say go back to your manager. Go back to your coaches and say, hey, I paid you this money. I'm going to write it off. Yeah. And that's actually something that when I started doing with Brad that – 
was something I never understood because I sit there and they go, okay, well, you paid this guy. I'm like, yeah, here's John mm-hmm. Smith and I gave him X amount of money. They're like, mm-hmm. oh, did you send him a, an I-9? A 1099. Yeah. A 1099. Right. Mm-hmm. 1099. Yep. I was all, what's that? Mm-hmm. Like, well, if you don't send that guy a 1099 and have his social security number and his full name, um, you're going to pay taxes on that amount of money. We don't yeah. care that you wrote him a check. Right. You have to you know, put it down that that money went for its training, management, mm-hmm. whatever services he provided, and now he's responsible for mm-hmm. paying taxes on it. But the IRS wants their money from somebody. It's like, all right. Yeah, and, and on the, the flip side of that, that's very important to remember if you pay anybody in cash, but th- this is something I've actually experienced. Um, so I, I also do stand-up comedy, and I get paid – a lot of times by check, but sometimes I'll get paid cash for that mm-hmm. too if it's just a little one-off thing. But just because they're paying you in cash doesn't mean they're not documenting it. Right. So exactly. And and sure enough, I, in fact, I just got one in the mail the other day. Uh-huh. You know the the annual, yeah the ten ninety nine. Mm-hmm. So just because somebody hands you cash, you can't think, oh well, that's pocket money under the table or whatever because they're still they're still going to report it, it. Right. yeah mm-hmm. uh, right. unless the person wants to pay the taxes for you they're going to record it down and is yeah. there a certain amount that you don't have to worry about like if you do a, a private lesson for a hundred bucks a one-off mm-hmm. you're a new guy and just how, what is the amount so it's up you can anything up to six hundred dollars i don't have to report that i paid six hundred or less than six hundred i'm sorry less than six hundred dollars that I paid somebody mm-hmm. for services, I don't have to report it. Okay, I could still deduct it, but I don't have to report it. Okay. So if I hired Richard to uh, come in and do some work at our company, mm-hmm. and it was the bill was five hundred fifty dollars at the end of the year, even though he's an individual, I'm not going to issue him a ten ninety nine. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. If it was six fifty, I'd have to. Yes. Because it's over six hundred. Yeah. And then one of the things that I, I was going to mention is I created this something called a payment acknowledgement form, and I've got one in Portuguese, I've got one in English, I can do one in Spanish too. But hmm. that's so that these people that insist you, on getting you paid can tell. Cash, I'm sorry, you can tell the guy works in MMA because yeah. he's got English Portuguese. and Portuguese. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Cover about ninety percent of yeah. the fighters there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You there's saying. Portuguese for, yeah. formulario. I can't even pronounce it. But uh, nonetheless, I have these these so that. Hey, the guy insists on being paid in cash. Okay, well, tell me your name. Give me your tax ID number. Give me your name and address and sign this, and then we're good. I'm paying you. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So it's something. Like I'm signing a receipt, mm-hmm. basically, it, from a That's all it is, just yeah, a receipt. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And if somebody says, oh, no, I don't want to do that, it's like, well, dude, everybody has to pay taxes. And, and I mean, I, I heard Dana White say this probably 30 or 40 times. Everybody has to pay taxes. Yeah. And so I'm just, I won't. I won't add on that conversation about Dana White and taxes, but yeah. he he has said it many times. Yeah, um, are you? Uh, you, know, you say that um, you said you you've done taxes for? Did you say probably about a hundred some odd? Fighters? Oh, right, at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and I'm sure you know some of them are on the 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 big end of the spectrum. Uh, they know you do Franks, and then and then all the way. All the way down, right? They are. I mean, do you get guys who do you see the occasional example of the guy who is wise beyond his years or the lady and is coming to you and going, Hey, just like I started off this interview, you know what? I'm I'm not making a lot of money right now. I just want to make sure I'm doing it the right way. Do you see that? I have some people like that. <laughs> but I also very few have, and far between. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but there, there are some like that, but not yeah. that many. But yeah. I was gonna say, here's a good example. Let's say, Richard, you were from uh, Belarus or from Spain. Okay. And you came and fought in the UFC one fight. Yeah. $10,000 and you lost. Yeah. Okay. So guess what? You walked away with 7000 before travel costs. Yeah. Okay. Well, the IRS took 30%. Mm. They come to me and they say, hey, Brad, can you help us reclaim that $3,000? And I can. Oh. Because you, when you came to the U.S. to fight, your expenses, you're going to come up with expenses. Mm-hmm. They're probably exceeded $10,000. You had no income after you deduct all your expenses. Right. So we're going to fill out a foreign tax form. Everybody in, the, in America fills out a 1040. There's a 1040 NR for non-residents. Uh-huh. They're going to fill that out, and you're going to get back all your money. Oh, okay. Less my fee, but you had a simple return. It's not that much. Right, right. Okay, okay. so that's something to be looking out for if— 
for, you know, worst case scenario, my career doesn't pan out exactly like we're hoping and I don't get the return invites and yeah, I end up kind of taking a loss there. Now, does the you same thing loss. apply? What if there's an American, and I know obviously it would probably depend on the country, but like Frank was just talking about with Australia, are there certain things you can look out for for a fighter who is having, an American fighter who is having to fight overseas where he's given up all that money in taxes when he fights over in Australia, but is there any type of um, uh, uh, relief coming there, back his way? There is, there is. Okay, so that's a really good point, Richard. So of the countries that I've been involved with, Australia, England, which actually it's UK because it includes Ireland mm -hmm. and uh, Northern Ireland. No, I, what is it? England UK, is Scotland, yeah. Scotland, Wales, and yeah, Northern yeah. Ireland, right. So when you fight over there or in, the, in Australia, they allow you to deduct your expenses before. So in other words, let's say you're going to make 100000 because you're making good money. Yeah. So let's say your expenses are 30000 which is, that's pretty realistic. Yeah. So now your net is seventy. Yeah. Right, your, your profit. Right. So they're going to tax you on seventy if you let me or somebody like me do the work and submit the forms before you go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then you get taxed on 70. Um, in California, they take 7%, but they also allow, if you're a non-Californian. Uh -huh. So also, if you submit your expenses in advance, they'll waive part of that 7%. Mm. So there's places you can go to that you can get relief. Um, there's also places you can go to that they don't tax you. Mm -hmm. Brazil. And, yep, Brazil. Brazil has an agreement with the U.S. I fought in Brazil. I learned this. Mm -hmm. Basically, you pay your taxes when you get home, but you don't pay Brazilian taxes on your income. As long okay. as you're not paid in Brazil. Yeah. If you're paid away from Brazil, we call it offshore, Yeah. then Brazil doesn't come after any Man. taxes. See, this stuff, it's so... It's so niche. I mean, it's so specialized. Some of this stuff, it you is. know, you can't at, figure this out without someone like. No, Brian. I mean, you must at the at the annual accountants convention when all you guys get together. You must have some of the best stories where you're like, you know, I hey, probably do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, because I mean, uh, the few times I've in the room training with guys, I remember one time. This was probably about four years back when I was first starting to realize, okay, I got to really, you know, make yeah. sure I get above board instead of just trying to pay at the end of the year, pay quarterly, all the different things that came up. And I was talking and there was a very other, and I'm not going to say his name, but a very prominent MMA fighter that everybody knows who it is. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting there talking and he's like, oh, you pay taxes? I'm like, well, yeah, I didn't for the first couple of years. I didn't pay yeah. enough. And now I'm trying to figure this shit out. I don't, I don't want to lose my home. I don't want to go to jail. Like, you know, you got to get on board, right? Yeah. He's all, yeah, I haven't done that yet. I'm like, what? Oh. And I even met this last time I talked to Brad. I'm like, hey, man, I had to talk to you about, yeah, I'm already dealing with him. I'm like, oh, you're getting him fixed up? Cool. I'm so glad to hear that he's going to be okay because ever since that conversation, I've always worried about the guy. Like Every time yeah. I see him fight, I'm like, fuck, but yeah. he doesn't face taxes. Yeah, well, he, he does now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah he's and, getting really close now to being all good. And oh, we've, cool. we've seen occasional yeah. examples. I mean, I remember famously with – one of the Diaz brothers, I think it was Nick, oh, just yeah. just said, I think on it was on a press conference or on something. On the pay per view. Yeah, that he right never after he lost taxes. to GSP. Yeah. yeah. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah, I he did. never I was paid there. taxes. Yep. Yeah. Did you, were you were there, did you, were you handing him a business card as he was walking out? I you was probably cringed, right? Yeah. I, I could not. Oh, you were still working. Okay. Right. Yeah, so I yeah. could not uh, rep, I couldn't help sure, fighters yeah. at that point. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But uh, were you thinking when you were with the UFC and you're seeing all this play out, did that, plant a seed in your mind that you know what if i'm ever not with this organization i could have a tremendous industry just helping the you you're like the the dr drew of uh of uh of tax issues you know what i'm saying i mean he you're, gets you're right he Richard. gets them he gets the the stars off the pills and yeah. you get their taxes straight yeah no I, I thought to myself because i had the relationships with not just the fighters but the managers a lot of the coaches that hey if this is if this ever ends, because I had a really cool job at the UFC, it was a great place to work. I'm yeah. not knocking them at all. It was a wonderful organization. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'm going to be a, an accountant for the fighters, and that's what I'm doing. And then I'm finding that not only is it fighters, but there's a lot of people that are independent contractors just like fighters. Mm -hmm. um, golfers, you got tennis players, you got boxers. Mm -hmm. 
And then yeah. you have all the actors yeah. and actresses and musicians as well. And uh, so now I'm getting some of those clients as well. I, I was going to say, uh, my, uh, my, my day, day job, job. is uh, running a brothel. And I deal with uh, prostitutes who are uh, independent contractors. Okay. They have this same issue. Mm-hmm. Mikey over here is in porn. Okay. Uh, he, uh, you deal with the same independent contractors and that sort of thing with your talent. So, so I can uh, help people like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, That's... a lot of them need it because, boy, you think that fighters have some tax issues. Oh. Turns out. I would think we would be bad, but I'm, yeah. I'm assuming that the oh. girls in those industries probably have us beat. Well, you're literally, <laughs> I mean, you're, yeah. you're literally living dual lives i mean you have two separate names you know so how can i bet you do yeah how can how you know I, that, that's not richard hunter's tax problem that's veronica love who's made all that money that's a whole separate person not to the irs as it turns out they only recognize you know what's uh, kind of funny i'm just thinking about right person. now yeah is that as a fighter when you realize you have tax problems you got to pay back so you know when you go into your fights you, there's a certain point where i've been like man i gotta you know like, oh that's a great paycheck i'm gonna get yeah but you know a lot of it's going back to the taxes yeah. to pay up yeah. stuff right so i'm going to fight basically for the irs you know you think about it and i'm sitting there going could you imagine one of the girls she gets behind in her taxes it's like go to work yeah <laughs> oh, go yeah. get it yeah no it, uh, <laughs> give uncle sam his money prostitute yourself out yeah no it it happens <laughs> yeah. it happens are there well that's that's a great point then because that was actually going to be one of my questions Brad was you know there while there's maybe no business that's exactly like professional fighting in terms of independent contracting there probably are another a number of entertainer based type you know oh, totally patients right? that yeah yeah are oh, yeah. dancers yeah, yeah that fall fall into that category mm-hmm. well that, now are you are you taking on new clients? I am. Okay. All right. So Ab- this absolutely. Is, so okay. Here's a plug. Yeah. I mean, yes. I'm taking on more clients. Yeah. Uh, I have another gal that works for me. She mm-hmm. came from the UFC as well, mm-hmm. in the tax department, and Kemalia. And now I've created a website. And you're talking about uh, stories to tell. Mm-hmm. So this isn't really a great story, but I have a new website. It's called CPA for MMA, and it's just CPA the number four. MMA. Oh, I like, like it. Mixed martial arts. Yeah. It's pretty short. So go check it out, CPA for MMA.com. But the web designer, I found these people that all they do is websites for. Oh, it's, M- it's coming up right behind you here over oh, your cool. shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. There we go. Yeah. Yep, there um, we go. You were saying? So they have all these tax clients. That's all they do is uh, websites for income tax preparers and accounting firms. Oh. So I found them. They go, oh. So I thought. I'm kind of new in this and starting my own business. Yeah. And so they've got a lot of these things that are on here, like make a payment, go to the IRS. There, oh, there's all these yeah. links. And then Tax if you look. forms. I see that one. Yeah. Right right there. Yeah. Uh, no. Translate. I'm sorry. Right there. Oh, translate. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. You, you can look at it in any language you want. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Which is really cool yeah. for, you know, our Japanese, our Brazilian, our anybody that doesn't speak English, Russian. Yeah. And so. Anyway, so I've got the guy on the phone. He goes, well, this is the coolest website I've ever done. Huh. Because all he does is just accounting firms. Yeah. You know, they're pretty yeah, a little spice you being in the MMA. Yeah. So th- this was a little more exciting to him. That's great. Yeah. So, you, yeah, I like it. You're the MMA CPA. MMA CPA, that's yes. That's you. So anyways, right. that, that's what I'm designing, and, or that's what I'm developing. Yeah. Back to what you were saying earlier, I thought for probably the last three years of working there that someday if I lose my job, this is what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. And You're in the be beginning, honest. I'm sorry that I'm happy that you lost your job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I am happy that you so, lost your job. So now it's, it's working out pretty good. I'm liking it. Yeah. Uh, I'm paying the bills, and you know that's that's the one of the main things. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Gosh. Yeah. No, I, I think it's great that I can help these people learn some business skills, because I mean we've all heard the stories over the years that people that made millions of dollars or lots of money. Yeah. They're broke, yeah, because they mismanaged it or they trusted the it's wrong an old person. Record. Yeah, yep. So, anyways, uh, I'm a CPA and like your mom, yeah. And so I've got ethics that I have to stand up to, yeah. And I'm not gonna go rip somebody off for, you know, some amount. It's not what I do. All right, here's an ethical question. <clears throat> so, let's say that uh, I've uh, I've got a fight uh, booked against Frank, right? Mm-hmm. And I 
catch wind of the he turns out in my scenario he doesn't have you as an accountant. Okay. This is this is early Frank Mir where he's not right. paying attention to tax or whatever. Okay, so I hear about this. So what I do is because I've already got you, I've got the MMA CPA, right? Okay. So what I do is I say, listen, Brad, Frank and I are gonna be having to do some press conferences and stuff together, okay? I have heard that this guy is not watching his taxes so what i want to do is i want you with me at the press conferences oh, and God. when we're within earshot of frank mm -hmm. i want you talking some lingo where you're saying to me well it's well i tell you what it's sure as good you've got your mileage log because if you didn't have <laughs> that the irs would be throwing you in prison and so what we're doing is a little psychological warfare now if i could get you to do that could i then here's the question Write off what I have to pay you because now you're one, you're my psychological warfare coach. You're involved in my camp. I'd say you have a business purpose. Yes. Yes. There we go. See there? <laughs> it's reasonable, it's ordinary, and it's necessary. Can't fight worth a damn, uh -huh. but I could win the press conference. There you go. So I'd get in your head. Yeah, I, I've had a few managers because I help a lot of managers. with. They give me referrals. Yeah. And they've said, look, Brad. If I see you down in the corner working for one of those fighters, I've got a problem. Because right now I've got clients that are fighting each other frequently. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay? Oh, I didn't think about that. Right. Okay. Yeah. And it's happened. I mean, yeah, I won't yeah. Yeah, yeah. name the names, but yeah, they're fighting each other. You can't have other. 100 guys in the top of the yeah. and not right. have them right. cross it paths. Just, it just happens. And so, you know, I've got my favorites. Yeah. I have my favorites at the UFC as well. And, um, you know, that's what it is. But as long as I'm not cornering, yeah. there's no bias. Yeah. 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 All right. I'm pretty proud of myself for thinking up that little loophole. I'm thinking the next time we have Brad on, yeah. we need to have either one of your coworkers or one of your coworkers come on. Okay. I want to hear be about, interesting. Yeah. I want to yeah. hear about their write-offs. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Boy, we're going to talk about some awkward silences. Right? Yeah. yeah. There's not much in uniform write-offs. 12 no, there's inch. Not. No, there's <laughs> Is not. that a write-off? There's right. not. You're right. There's not much in, uh, in uniform, but they do, if they're smart, they're writing off uh, hair, Nails. Oh, you know, all, all the cosmetic stuff. All of yeah. that. All, all the that. beauty stuff. A yep. spa treatment. Yeah, because a uniform I mean, only anything. counts if you have a tag on. Like, it's a uniform required for work. But yeah. th that wouldn't fall into a gray area. The dre Like, if a girl has to show up to work dressed up like a, a schoolgirl. No, you could write that off. You'd write that off. Yeah, okay, absolutely. All the costumes. Because it's not. So, it's a costume. It's not something you wear daily yeah. Yeah. outside. Because I thought I could write off suits if I started, you know, because of doing the commentary. Yeah. Brad notified me that the suits was, nah, Yeah. Work. Well, it depends a lot of things. It depends. So if Frank wears that suit only for commentary where he's getting paid, then it's cool. Mm -hmm. But if Frank then goes to a wedding and wears a suit, mm -hmm. or he goes to a bar mitzvah and wears a suit, uh, or he goes to something me, else and wears a suit. Let me illustrate that point for you, Frank. If O.J. Simpson had only worn the Bruno Mollies <laughs> on the sidelines when he was doing the play-by-play, the -play, he could have deducted them on taxes. But if he then wears them to the scene of a double murder – He's negated his oh, tax write-off. Right. Am I right? It's dead, right? It's right? not a deduction. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He and you would have, outside I of like how purpose. you tied that together. That was some yeah. high-level uh, shit right there. Well, right. I just know that if Brad had OJ as a client, for all I know, maybe he does. I don't know. He's not revealing his right, client right. list. You would advise him probably of that, right? Oh, don't of course. wear those shoes to the murder. No, no, no. Because no. those tax are expensive purposes. shoes. <laughs> for tax no, no. I, my ethics don't allow me to advise on that. Very nice. Anything you think we missed that you wanted to bring up tonight? Uh, let's see. Gosh. So just a couple things. I'll tell anybody that's an athlete that's listening. So if you wanted me to help you, I have this spreadsheet that I would share with you. And it has about 50 types of expenses that are the ordinary necessary expenses. Um, a word to think about is the name Ron. Like everybody knows the person named Ron. Okay. In tax lingo, it stands for reasonable, ordinary, necessary. Oh. So if you're going to spend money, you go, hey, is that a write-off? If it's related to business and you go, hey, it's reasonable, it's ordinary, it's necessary, write yeah. it off. It's yeah. a deduction. Another thing I have is I, I talked about earlier, um, writing off your house for your home, home office. Mm -hmm. I've got a schedule I can walk you through. It'll help you to deduct that to the maximum. That's safe. Uh, I won't do anything that's not safe and proper. Right. And then, Which uh, also, too, I mean, on your part, is showing you being ethical because – you could just ask them for this information and do it yourself and log in another 6, 10, 15 hours of work that they're going to have to pay you for. Right. By you giving them this information, they're helping themselves. They're also saving themselves money. That's what I want them to do. Yeah. I mean, I've got one person that did, he gave me a big fat retainer. He said, look, Brad, 
I haven't done taxes for four years. I want you to do the whole thing. Yeah. Obviously, I can't look at all of his expenses on his bank account or credit card and know what everything is. Yeah. But I did everything I could and then asked him the questions on the big items, and that's what we did. Cost him a lot of money. Or just the opposite. I'll help you to get all the data. You tell me what all the data is. I can add it all up. That's easy. Yeah. And well, we'll, and we'll do a tax return. I also like the idea, too. I mean, like Frank was talking about, you know, you, you want to feel secure that you're with somebody who's not overbilling. I also want to feel secure in that I'm, I don't have an accountant who's trying to curry favor with me by playing fast and loose with the deductions where, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh, I made $2 million and I'm getting money back. Like, you know, I, I, I don't want that because although that might feel pretty good up front, I'm still liable and on the hook for that kind of thing. So I want the voice you of are. reason in you my are. corner. Yeah. 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 I mean, so if, if you're looking for somebody that's going to cheat for you, it's not me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, You're I looking for somebody that's going to be ethical I try. and aggressive. I keep trying to offer him hundreds <laughs> on the side. Like, come on, man. I'm going to be aggressive. <laughs> yeah. and, and I understand, like, you know, I guess we should talk about food real quick. Yeah. So that Frank, Frank's here is like perked food. up. He likes food. Okay. So yeah. food, if you ask the IRS, they're going to say, hey, everybody has to eat. It's non-deductible. Mm. I'm going to say, oh, okay, but wait a minute. Let's split up your food into three or four categories. You've got when you're traveling out of town on business, all your meals are business meals. Mm -hmm. If you're in town where you live and you buy a meal, if it was with your training partners or your coaches or you talk business, yeah. it's a deductible meal. Yeah. You're supposed to write <clears throat> the purpose, who, what, where, and when about the back of the receipt. That's, back of the receipt. I, but, that's what but I that's did, easy yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. um, but then a lot of people have other meals that are on their credit card, like they hit Taco Bell or they went to – you know, Chili's or wherever it was they went, but it wasn't business. It was personal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And then there's the other category. A lot of people eat very, very healthy. Mm -hmm. They eat specialized diets. Specialized diets. Frank can, can talk all about this. But, I mean, they go to Whole Foods. They go to Sprouts. They go to the vitamin store. They get uh, protein drinks at the juice bar. Those things there, they're not what everybody else buys and yeah. consumes. So IRS – I mean, those are special foods, so we're going to deduct the majority of that cost as special cost for an athlete. That's a great point. Yeah, because yeah. were I not doing this job, I might not have to adhere so strictly necessary. to that diet. Right. Uh, yeah, right. especially like some of the supplements and things yep. like that. 100%. Brett, this has been fascinating. Yeah. This was uh, exactly what I'd hoped it would be because I'm telling you, a lot of people may not think that uh, you know uh, uh, accounting on its own sounds super sexy, but uh, when you're, or maybe it does. I mean, maybe you take I, issue no, no, with no, that. No. I don't. I don't know. Maybe I had a yeah. tough time when it. With it at first, maybe it's, yeah, but it's but, cool talking to Brad. Well, no, I, I was always have great conversations at his house. For for fans, this is the kind of stuff that they're always really interested in because they don't hear about it otherwise. You know, they're not this kind of stuff doesn't get discussed in the countdown shows or anything no. like that. But when you really pull back the curtain, it can be one of the greatest uh, either stress factors or relief factors. For some of their favorite fighters, well, it's one of the they biggest taboos. If you think about it, yeah. I mean, yeah. in common language, you sit down and we all have a beer. People don't really want to talk about their taxes. Yeah, I, they're confusing. They're scary. I don't know if the government mm -hmm. is kind of brainwashed and thinking that way that we're all worried about each other, yeah. but. There is, I think, a kind of a, a difficulty of bringing breaching this topic. It's almost like talking yeah. about religion and politics. Yeah. I put taxes kind of in there where it could be very tabooish and, and right. freak people out. Yeah, I think there's two things. I th especially in this this MMA space we're talking about. I think I think number one, uh, probably if if I've gotten myself into trouble, it's because I have a tendency to adopt the ignore it and it'll go away mindset. So mm -hmm. that's going to keep me from right. wanting to acknowledge it. And then the other thing is too. I think to the casual fan uh, in any type of entertainment or celebrity space, there's always this mindset of, oh my gosh, I've seen this person on television. They must be rich. They must be set for life. And if I want to keep up they some of that, be. yeah, but if I want to, exactly, but if I want to keep up some of that mystique, maybe pride a little bit sometimes is keeping me from being very, uh, uh, you know, candid uh, with the right people about what my situation is. So I think it's a great conversation to yeah. have because you just, you just have to be practical about it along Absolutely. the way. All right. The website is cpa4mma.com, and that's where you can find Brad Smuckler. Brad, this has uh, been great. Come on yeah. in and visit us again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate hey, it. You know, maybe maybe uh, uh, around – I know it's your busy season, but maybe sometime around April. 
You know, that'd be the <laughs> we'll be ready to listen. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. At, end of April. Oh, end of end, April. End of okay, April. after yep. yeah, getting ready for the new year. Yeah, the accountants. You just go MIA during April, don't you? Uh, it's going to be really challenging. Yeah, yes. that's what I hear. It's that's challenging. I, Last night was late. Yeah. This morning was early. Yeah. Tonight will be late. Yeah. It'll be early again tomorrow. Well, thanks for staying up late yeah. with us. Thank Sorry, you, Richard. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate awesome. it.